Hey guys, I just want to inform you before we start that voting for the next episode of Grab Bag Reviews is going to be opening tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. So if you want to decide what songs I talk about in this series next for a pledge of just $2 per main series video, now would be a great time to do that. More on that later. This video contains elements that are not suitable for children under the age of 14. Viewer discretion is advised. Hey guys, Sean Fay Wolf of Diamond Axe Studios here, and welcome to episode 8 of Grab Bag Reviews. This is the series where, once every few months, I run a vote amongst my patrons to see which 15 songs y'all want me to talk about the most, and I give a review to each of them. On top of that, all of my top supporters on Patreon each get to select one song for me to review in this video as well, and when you put all those numbers together, that makes for nearly a hundred songs we're going to be talking about in this video. I'll talk more about my Patreon at the end of the video, though. For now, all you need to know is that if you want to take part in the voting for the next episode, of grab bag reviews, you can do that for a pledge of just $2 per main series video. So please keep that in mind and consider whether or not you might want to join as you watch this video here today. Now let's get right into it and see what y'all voted for me to talk about. Let's do it. <laughs> There are some songs where the more you think about them and the more you look into them, the more you love them. Of course, this song is best known as being the end credit song for the first Spongebob movie, and for that it has a permanent place in the hearts of millennials everywhere, but what I bet you didn't know is that this band, this song, and the album it came from were actually a driving force behind the creation of Spongebob Squarepants as a show itself. Ween are technically an alt-rock band, but they're one of those bands who reinvent themselves with every album, constantly finding new approaches and concepts to base their entire album around. And so for their 1997 album, The Mollusk, which by the way has fucking awesome cover art designed by legendary graphic designer Storm Thorgensen, same guy who did Dark Side of the Moon's artwork, was an album that featured a genre mash ultimately centered around an off-kilter psychedelic nautical theme, of which Ocean Man is the album closer and the ultimate sum up of what they were going for with the project. Apparently Steven Hillenburg was a big Ween fan and the whole left of the dial LSD sea shanty aesthetic was the absolutely perfect fit for the new cartoon he was developing, Spongebob Squarepants, leading to not only a lot of motifs and concepts from the album being referenced within the show itself, but also to Ween themselves being contracted to make an original song for the show, which would become Loop de Loop, the song about tying your shoes. Yeah, that was made by the same guys who made Ocean Man. In terms of the song itself, I honestly don't know what to say about it because it's basically the perfect closing credits theme for Spongebob as a series. A carefree, childlike man soaking up the thirst of the land, going around having wacky, bizarre, but ultimately joyful and innocent adventures all throughout the wonderful nautical world. All of the joy, good fun, and intensely contagious likability that made those first few seasons of Spongebob such a phenomenon are present within this song in full force. And I'm proud to say that it's a song that I adore with all of my soul. <laughs> A little while back, I talked about the soundtrack to Thomas the Tank Engine, and how even all these years later, I can still vividly remember so many musical themes and motifs from that show all these years later. I can still vividly remember so many musical themes and motifs from that show, and how the richness and complexity they put into that soundtrack was a primary factor in kickstarting my lifelong fascination and love for music. And after all, good music is good music, and no matter what age you are, you'll always be able to appreciate it. And that's part of the reason why I have such a huge affinity for another childhood favorite show of mine, Schoolhouse Rock. The show came out more than 20 years before I was born, so obviously I never watched it on Saturday mornings or anything, but I remember they used to play these VHS tapes all the time in school, and damn it, they still work. The series was apparently created by a TV executive who realized that his son was having difficulty memorizing multiplication tables, but could easily remember Rolling Stones lyrics. And so he got Michael Eisner and Chuck Jones on board to create a series that teaches kids about all these concepts using pop music formats, with Conjunction Junction being among the most famous of them. Performed by noted jazz trumpeter and 
Griffin sideman Jack Sheldon, they managed to put together a ridiculously sticky earworm of a hook for this one. To this day, I still can't hear basically any word that rhymes with function without this song playing in the back of my head. And likewise, I've always been able to easily remember what the definition of a conjunction is. They're words that link pieces of sentences together, just like boxcars linking trains together in a junction. The production on this song definitely isn't modern, but I wouldn't call it dated either for the most part, because it pulls from very simple, timeless jazz concepts that will always be very fundamentally appealing. I don't know if these videos are still being used in schools, but I definitely know I'll be showing them to my kids one day, and I respect the hell out of them. And now, let's take a break from the main vote to look at some songs that my top patrons requested. Simply having a wonderful Christmas time the Wonderful Christmas Time is often attacked by critics as one of Paul McCartney's most basic, undercooked, and ultimately annoying tunes, from the moment it came out in 1979 right up to the present day. A lot of people seem to really hate this song, and trust me, I get it. This song represents everything that's wrong with Christmas music, from the overplay to the cloying simplicity to the dated basicness. And honestly, that's the exact reason I find it kind of impossible to dislike. If this were just a normal song that McCartney wrote, I agree with all those criticisms, 100%. But putting it in the context of a Christmas song makes all the simplicity forgivable, and while it does sound ridiculously dated, I mean, it's still 20 years younger than most of the songs it's sharing airplay with, a bouncy synth-pop song stacked with the most dated production possible fills a hole in the Christmas airplay schedule that maybe didn't need to exist, but if it were to disappear now that we have it, something would feel off. I'm not crazy, I'm I'm just a little unwell, I know, right now you can't tell, but stay a while and maybe then you'll see. So this requester only wanted me to talk about this one because it's their favorite Matchbox 20 song, and yeah, I'd say that's some pretty good taste on display there. I think it's literally impossible to have grown up in the 2000s and not have some kind of nostalgia for this song. Whenever I think of listening to the radio in my childhood, this is one of the first songs that comes to mind. And especially having listened to a few of Rob Thomas's earlier songs for my ranking of every number one hit of the 2000s, I now appreciate more than ever just how much tighter and more polished he got in the three years between Bent and this. Matchbox 20 has always had a very warm, inviting sound to them, and those adjectives are probably the best ones I'd use to describe this song, too. This is some good stuff. One of my favorite things to see in music is when an act decides to throw a whole bunch of genres into a blender that have no business working together as well as they do, and Alabama 3 are one of the best examples of this, combining the distinctive squelchy synth patterns of acid rock with trip-hop and country elements to create an absolutely delectable musical palette. These guys are best known for making the opening theme to The Sopranos, Woke Up This Morning, which was originally released as a single in 1997, with this song, Speed to the Sound of Loneliness, as its follow-up single. While Woke Up This Morning leans much harder into the darker trip-hop and acid jazz sounds. This one is far bluesier, creating a tune I could easily hear coming out of a mid-90s country act, but elevated to a new realm of appeal through its distinctive alt-rock flavored lyrics and poppy house elements in the undercarriage. This was a great discovery. This one's going right in the playlist. And for the next exciting chapter of Sean's patron slowly but surely turn him into a fan of metal, we've got Winter by Oceans of Slumber, a progressive metal band most notable for frontwoman Cammie Gilbert's beautiful, haunting keen of a voice that's put to absolutely stellar work on this eight-minute epic called Winter. As time goes on, progressive metal in particular, which is the fusion of the power and edge of metal with the grandeur and classical influences of alt-rock, I'm realizing more and more that that's one of my favorite genres, and when you combine it with the slower, more ambient aspects of the subgenre called doom metal that give Winter such a metal mesmerizing and chilly opening that sets the perfect tone and manages to stay with you throughout the thrashing of the rest of the piece, yeah, this really is something special. Baby, hey, baby, hey. Three, two, one. So, this is a song that comes from Love Live School Idol Festival, a Japanese rhythm gacha game created as part of the School Idol franchise, which is a giant multimedia project consisting of games, music, anime, manga, and much more centered around dozens of teenage schoolgirls who become pop culture idols. If the comments under this song are to be believed, this is the first song in the Love Live franchise's 11-year history to be entirely in English, and yeah, I can see why this is the one they chose, given the whole 2000s nostalgia craze and pop-punk revival. This song definitely has its finger on the pulse of what a lot of American 
Americans want to hear right now. This is honestly kind of surreal, actually. I'm writing this as I edit the number one hits of the 2000s video, and now in the first few minutes of this video, I've already talked about a better version of Bent by Matchbox 20, and now a better version of Girlfriend by Avril Lavigne. I hope someone tries to give me a fixed version of Candy Shop to review next. That'd be a damn miracle. I know that you're I know I'm to blame But I'll make you work I'll make you stay Considering that Black Bear has really been blowing up over the past few years as both a powerful force behind the scenes and a musician in his own right, it only seems fitting to take a step back and look at his debut single from back in 2013, which is very distinctive from anything else I've heard from the man, being much more low, moody, and atmospheric than anything else I've heard through my admittedly very limited browsing through his oeuvre. Black Bear actually remade the song in 2019 for his fourth album, and while the vocals are a bit cleaner and there's more distinctly Black Bear bass to it, it ultimately stayed the same, which strikes me is somewhat of a missed opportunity because this song has room to grow. And don't get me wrong, it sounds fine enough, but it's got that problem where it just kind of drifts around for way too long without really going anywhere or building to anything, and by the end of it, you'll have heard the phrase, I'm in New York, you're in LA, so many times that you'll be exhausted by the mere concept of geography. Not a bad song per se, but definitely a primitive one. So remember what I said before about combinations of genres and ideas that have absolutely no right working together as well as they do? Well, here we have Terror Packets by Backwash and Censored Dialogue, an industrial-flavored new metal song about the difficulties faced through dealing with systemic racism while also transitioning and seeking hormone replacement therapy. This is obviously a song that I, as a straight white guy, can't relate to directly, but much like the work from Sophie I've sampled has been able to help me understand what the gender euphoria feels like by capturing that emotion through music, the blaring siren and harsh, clanging, electro-grind elements in this song really sell you on the immense whirling vortex of gravity that can be found in the raw anger and frustration, as Censor Dialogue rants on about everything they've had to sacrifice to be who they really are, while Backwash growls out about how the entire world seems designed to quash every aspect of who she is. The requester says this is one of their favorite albums of the year, and I can see why. This is damn effective. Just that flower, soul, a little red wine, don't forget a dollar but tomato sauce, for sweetness and that extra Alright, so in keeping with Watcher's never-ending quest to make me review every single piece of Australian pop culture ever captured through music, here we have what is apparently one of the most beloved Australian Christmas songs, and yeah, if I had to imagine what an Australian Christmas song would sound like, a country rockish Dylan pastiche about a man in jail telling his brother everything he wishes he could do with his family on the holiday sounds about right. There's a real bitter sweetness to this song that effortlessly tugs at your heartstrings. The concept of a man telling his brother how to make his world-famous gravy because he's not there to do it himself beautifully captures is the intimate closeness of family at Christmas time, and the rambling affect he puts on as he chats and jokes with his brother about all the things his loved ones are up to that he's not going to get to see, it's incredibly moving, and it captures the spirit of Christmas in one of the more unique and potent ways I've ever heard. <laughs> If you ever get the idea in your head that a ukulele song sung by a white dude with a voice high enough to chomp a contrail can't be emotionally resonant, well, in Canadian pop band Marianas Trench has something to say about that. Because despite its cutesy exterior, this is a devastating breakup song that really conveys just how utterly destroyed this guy is by his loss through the lens of reflecting on their one last night together before she left. Of particular note is the song's bridge, where the intensity builds higher and higher as he lists every song he's ever written about this woman, and hearing all of the time, effort, and passion this man has put into serenading his love for her only to realize that it's all gonna be gone the next day? That's heavy, man. The song is subversive in the best sense of the word. Oh, I'm not okay. 2019, My Chemical Romance reunited after a six-year hiatus, and so far they've spent the time then doing tours, very much not doing tours because of the Round Boys, and now looking to do tours again. I can only hope they've got a few new musical ideas kicking around in their noggins after all that time together, because if there's any legacy band that has the potential to pull an Aerosmith-level comeback and absolutely dominate the 2020s, it's MCR, with I'm Not Okay being a perfect example of why that is. In a scene like today, where pop-punk and emo music have both made huge comebacks and basically defined the late 20s, 
2010s and early 2020s thus far, and is one of the most beloved and acclaimed bands in both of those styles who have been able to take avant-garde ideas and see massive pop success with them, I think the potential there is absolutely gargantuan. Until then, I guess we can just keep listening to I'm Not Okay. It's not a song that gives me a ton to say about, but that is far from a bad thing. Black Parade is obviously a masterpiece, but if you want a simpler taste of this band's appeal, this one will do you quite nicely. <laughs> I feel like the level of passion and dedication that fans have for their chosen franchises is a truly remarkable thing that is taken for granted far too often. This here is a fan-made mashup of a whole bunch of themes and concepts from Sonic the Hedgehog to create the ultimate theme song for Sonic's sidekick, Tails. And honestly, if you'd told me this was an official soundtrack piece, I wouldn't doubt it for a second. I'm not a big Sonic fan myself, but I did love Mega Collection as a kid. I've heard a good few Sonic tracks in Smash, and of course the Sonic soundtrack is all over gaming YouTube. And I can safely say that this piece captures the freewheeling, journey-esque, unencumbered, soaring heights that this series often reaches at its best. If Sonic Team were to hear this, I'm sure they'd be proud. Okay, stop me if you've heard this one before. One of Drake's audio engineers and one of Adele's vocal coaches walk into a bat mitzvah and they decide to start an R&B duo called Emotional Oranges. I would give you the punchline if that weren't literally the actual story of how this group came to be, and I can't even give you the names of the people involved because everyone working on this project is so serious about maintaining their privacy that no one actually knows their real names. Regardless of what they're called though, Emotional Oranges are one hell of a slick group of this song built this way is any indication. This is one of those songs that just sort of tingles just right, gliding effortlessly along a well-captioned sailboat driven forward by a crisp percussion line and a nice spacious R&B guitar solo. None of the lyrics really stood out to me one way or another, but when your groove is this slick and natural, you really don't have much to add, and I can safely say that this is a great throwback to the best side of 90s R&B. And with that, let's take a break from these top patron requests and get back to the main vote. <laughs> This takes me back. I remember the release of this song quite vividly. It was in the summer of 2018, I'd been running my channel for nearly a year, I probably would have had around 300 subscribers at the time, probably, and everyone was talking about the big new song by 21 Pilots. This was three years after Blurry Face, the album that exploded these guys into the mainstream and really solidified this kind of alt-hip-hop crossover mono-genre affect as one of the defining musical sounds of the 2010s, while being a lot better than that description I gave would imply. Anyways, for the first time in years we had a new T.O.P. song, and everyone was absolutely losing their minds over how good it was, how great these guys were, and how this was going to be another smash hit for them, and then I went and listened to it and thought it was really good despite the fact that I just did not give one single shit about it. And frankly, that's an opinion I still hold to this day. You see, back then I was still operating under some sort of notion that objectivity and music critique really mattered, and that I was obligated to give music credit if I found some elements in it to be objectively praiseworthy, even if on a personal level they didn't really mesh with me. And I think Jumpsuit was one of the first songs that made me realize that I didn't need to be nice to a song just because I could appreciate the positives of it in a vacuum. I mean, the song itself is well made, some nice driving bass guitar licks, a heavier atmosphere than you usually find from this group, and a more sweeping, grander scope to the whole thing. I can definitely understand why so many people loved it, but no matter how much I tried, I just couldn't stop the song from completely leaving my head the second it was over. And again, that's still true. I don't think I could hum you anything in this song if it's been more than five minutes since I listened to it. These days I tend to focus my critiques around songs that speak to me, or that that really click with me, and while it's my job to try and put into words why a song speaks to or clicks with me, sometimes the answer to that question is simply that I can't point to anything in it that I found particularly interesting or memorable, and while that answer might not be the most satisfying, it's also the most honest, and that's basically where I stand on Jumpsuit and most of the rest of what I heard from that album to this day. Sorry. <laughs> So this is the best Lud Biscuit song, I guess. 
I mean, I'm not overly familiar with their discography, but out of what I heard, yeah, this is the best one by a fairly substantial margin. We've seen new metal make a pretty big resurgence in recent years as part of a general rock revival in the fringy corners of the mainstream, and with that, I've seen a lot of people reevaluating Limp Bizkit and their reputation they gained as the worst band in history who carried the torch for everything wrong with the whiny, insufferable, and sludgy white trashiness of the OG new metal scene. And while I'm definitely not the main person qualified to pass that judgment, yeah, I'm more than a bit skeptical. Even on this song, which is the best I've heard purely because it's got a decent hook to it, and I'm a big fan of songs that are basically tanks rolling into town and declaring their domination over the landscape. I mean, everything outside of the chorus is still just the most basic new metal flexing and posturing there is, and the guitars are still as over-heavy, sludgy, and crunched up as ever. Really, the only notable thing in the verses is the shout-out to non-binary people, as Fred Durst gives a shout-out to the ladies, the fellas, and the people who just don't give a fuck. Which, let's be real, it was Limp Bizkit it, and it was 2001. I'm giving the probability to a solid 70% that that was just a happy accident. L look, I get why this sound was so big. It was basically the soundtrack for the same crowd that made Fight Club such a big hit a few years earlier, and I get why even people who hate Limp Bizkit turn apologist for this one, but me personally, I, I guess I lean more towards taking it than leaving it, but not by a whole lot. Also, fun fact, apparently Limp Bizkit received a letter from the World Trade Center thanking them for featuring the Twin Towers in their music video. Fred Durst received that letter on September 10th, 2001. Okay, back to the top patron requests. All around me are familiar faces, worn out places, worn out faces. I understand why this cover has become such a joke among people. The original Mad World by Tears for Peers has a cool as hell new wave masterpiece, whereas this one just sounds like a sad boy emo facsimile of the original, which is what it is. It's very easy to mock, I get it, but I have to say, while it may be a worn out cliche to strip down and James Arthurify songs these days, this is one of the few that actually feels like it's kind of justified. The composition and lyrics of this song actually do lend themselves well to the new drab aesthetic, and while I don't think this version deserves to have overtaken the original in terms of pop culture relevance like it has, I also don't think it's a dancing on my own situation where doing this to it totally misses the point. This was made for the Donnie Darko soundtrack, and the producer had so little money that he literally just had one of his friends record this instead of hiring someone well known, and with no expectations whatsoever that it would become a worldwide smash hit. I feel like this is kinda like Johnny Cash covering Nine Inch Nails, an idea that seems laughable at the outset, but kinda makes more more sense the more you think about it. And while this experience obviously didn't turn out anywhere near as amazing as Hurt did, I still can't say that I dislike it. Rockhampton have always been a very eclectic group, with every song I've heard from them over the course of doing this show being very different, but I'll be damned, I didn't know they had the ability to hit this hard. Apparently this song is a message to one of their former members who was kicked out after sexual assault allegations, and holy shit, they make you feel that grief of betrayal, of being absolutely ripped apart. They are tearing themselves open and letting you see the bleeding of their soul on this track. I will say that for me personally, something about it didn't fully connect. They captured the rawness of their emotions for sure, but I still felt like I was watching them as an outsider, as opposed to other songs built from real-life trauma, Praying by Kesha being the most notable example, that really drew me in and got me invested in the plight of the situation I previously didn't know much about. If you were invested in Brockhampton and feel betrayed by this whole situation, then I imagine a song like this was everything you possibly could have wanted to help let out your pain. And while I had a hard time really feeling it as an outsider to the whole phenomenon, I can certainly appreciate and respect the potency of this piece. Well, I can't say I've ever heard a hyper-tinged drill song about lusting for cat boys. Truly, this series is a wonderland of new, enchanting discoveries, especially since this one actually kinda slaps. No, for real, this one goes hard as fuck. This is a real raging rave energy to it. It kinda reminds me of Travis Scott's harder stuff, not in terms of the actual sound, but in terms of how it just kinda brings out something primal and animalistic in you. I mean, yeah, the lyrics are a total joke. It ends with a screamo break about the wonders of cat boys, but still, it's kinda dope for what it is. I was actually surprised by how genuinely into this I was able to get. <laughs> This song was suggested by Pride, a good friend of mine who has helped me immensely with building my Discord server over the years. So I feel bad saying this about the song he suggested, a song which I'm sure relates deeply to his own life and experiences as a human, but here it goes. 
If I'm gonna listen to a bastardization of Country Roads Take Me Home, I'll take Mario any day of the week over this. Here I come, Constantinople, here I come, Constantinople, I'm coming, Constantinople, here I come. When I hear Constantinople by the residents, all I can imagine is one dude, on acid, sitting in the corner, curled up in a ball, hearing this song, and absolutely freaking the fuck out as he realizes that this guy is coming directly to Constantinople to fuck his shit up. Even as someone who's never done acid and has no immediate plans to, I've talked to enough people who have done acid to tell me that this is basically what the beginning of a bad acid trip sounds like. Right around the time that the trip actually starts to go horribly wrong, and when you throw some legitimately cool harmonic tricks in there, yeah, I'd say this one gets a solid 7 out of 13. Spectral love is playing with lights, yeah, just say right. So apparently this is Night Lab, most notable for being the musical project of Oscar Isaac, an actor known for, among other things, playing Poe Dameron in the new Star Wars trilogy. That's a very interesting piece of trivia, and also just about the only thing I have to say about this. I mean, it sounds nice, it doesn't really change much, and kind of just stays on the same vibe the whole way through, but it's a nice little vibe. I personally don't really see many standout qualities to this one, one way or another. It sounds like something I'd hear some dudes jamming out at an open mic night, or at a soundstage in a park. I'll applaud when they're done, I might throw a buck in their open guitar case, I appreciate that but it's not really anything I'm going to remember. So this is apparently known for being one of the most iconic tracks from Guitar Hero 3, and that makes sense because when I heard it, my first thought was that they probably started with a Guitar Hero level and then worked backwards and made the song from there. That's not an insult, by the way. Guitar Hero kicks ass, and this is some classic shit with some great belting vocals that really string all the crazy guitar fuckery together. The song is cool because it has a lot of math rock tropes, what with the constantly switching time signatures and odd rhythms, but it incorporates these tropes into an accessible mid-2000s alt-rock format that isn't too alienating. This is the kind of song that I can imagine Imagine acting as a sort of gateway drug into math rock, especially considering its status within the guitar hero. I was very hesitant to listen to Pets by TWRP, considering that this requester told me it was a eulogy to a deceased pet, and considering that we unfortunately recently lost our cat Boo, yeah, I was anticipating that this song would absolutely wreck me. And yet it didn't. I have a lot of appreciation for songs that are able to capture true sadness without absolutely drowning the listeners in mopiness, and that's what we've got here. This song isn't a downer. It honestly kind of soars with the only suggestion of sadness in the composition being an air of wistfulness, and so when you put the reflection on all the good times this guy had with his lost pet on top of that, it comes across more as a celebration of the good times, more of a wake than a funeral. Even beyond that, the song really moves. The talk box vocals give it a distinctive identity, and the vibe I got from it was that it felt your pain, but it wasn't gonna let you fall. And considering what I've had to go through with Boo recently, I really appreciate that. <laughs> This requester said that this song, from the soundtrack to the indie RPG Omori, kind of creeped them out, and I've gotta be honest, I don't really see how. Maybe it was different within the context of the game, but just listening to it on its own, I found this to be a nice, relaxing ambient piece. There are a couple off-kilter bits to it, most notably the warbling whistle, but the vibe I get from this is more of a moment of peace and relaxation in the middle of a scary experience, rather than the scary experience itself. Like, this is something I could imagine playing as you walk through a peaceful forest in a resi game or something. The mixing kind of suggests a large area, but it doesn't really fill it all up. It creates a good atmosphere for contemplation. I can imagine something like this on a Headspace soundtrack. Pretty cool, I say. I have to say, it's really assuring that there are still some places in the world where funk can be the absolute biggest music around. Granted, this isn't particularly hard funk, it's still light and accessible, but this is still a recent release from Kensi Yonezu, who's one of the biggest pop stars in Japan. Apparently, he's started out as a Vocaloid pioneer before putting his own voice out there about a decade ago. I wasn't able to confirm this, but apparently according to the requester, one of this dude's songs was number one on the Japanese year-end list for two years in a row, so that's pretty neat. All this backstory is, once again, more interesting than the song itself. It's definitely got some pretty distinctive sections with really unique chord patterns in each that you don't typically see in Western pop music, so that's pretty cool, but for the most part, this one is what it is, and I like what it is. Versace breakfast, eating eggs, everybody know me. Eggs. I'm eating eggs. Versace eggs. Love these eggs. 
dude really likes his eggs, doesn't he? Uh, what we've got here is, um, I guess this is sort of a pastiche of the late 2000s Atlanta sound with all the chiptune effects coming together to create a hard-ass beat, or at least, again, a pastiche of that sound. And these two guys use it to create a comedy rap song about how they'll only take the most high-end eggs for their breakfast, up to and including destroying their teeth by biting into diamonds. It's mildly amusing, the kind of thing that I'm more happy that it exists than I am inclined to return to it much. I like the little lyrical details, like rhyming hater with alligator and going off on a tangent about hanging out at Starbucks without ordering anything. There is something to this whole thing, I think. My brother was listening to this with me, and he said it reminded him of Thugnificent from the Boondocks, and I haven't seen that show, so I'm just gonna take his word for it. There's one thing I've realized looking back at a childhood of watching VeggieTales on VHS, it's that the music in these things go way, way harder than they have any right to. Like, this is a show starring talking vegetables teaching you Bible lessons. Why the hell am I able to remember so many absolute bops from this show? The Larry Boy theme song in particular, the entrance music for Larry the Cucumber's superhero alter ego, is an absolute banger of a kick-ass big brass piece with a nasty-ass guitar solo. It's just, dude, you didn't have to go this hard for Larry Boy, and yet you did, and I am eternally grateful. I said it before and I'll say it again, if you're gonna blow your budget on anything in a kid's show, do it on the music, cause that's what's gonna stick with the kids watching for the longest time. And now, let's get back to the main vote. <laughs> The common assumption about Bruno Mars is that he really only dug deep into the throwback stuff starting with Unorthodox Jukebox, and before that he was just kind of doing his own flavor of R&B pop that was significantly less endearing, and while that's not entirely true, the album is called Doo-Wops and Hooligans after all, you can still tell there was definitely a demarcation point between the two albums, and the change was for the better as indicated by this song. I mean, you can tell this song did take some retro influences, I can definitely see some Little Richard and James Brown DNA in this, but that DNA is pretty far down the chain, let's be real. I recognized this song when I listened to it for this video, but I didn't recognize it as a Bruno Mars song. I recognized it as a commercial jingle, because I don't know where, but I am positive I've heard this used in a commercial for some product or another at some point. The actual lyrics about how Bruno Mars is so sexy that all the girls need to run away before he seduces them by the mere act of being in their presence should be so ridiculous that it works its way back around to being awesome. You bet your ass James Brown could have pulled that off, but it just kind of doesn't because it sounds more like something on the soundtrack to a cheap animated kids movie than a real song you'll listen to for its own sake. Like, just imagine this song over a scene where the Scooby-Doo gang are running through all those doors in the hallway, and the song is about how they need to run away from a dude in a Halloween costume, and tell me that doesn't fit just a little too well in your brain. I can't see why people like this, it definitely has energy and drive, but to me, this is a textbook example of the type of sound that Bruno had to get away from to get into the sweet little niche he exists in these days. <laughs> I'm kind of amazed that it took this long for this song to pop up in this series. After all, I've said several times before that Billy Joel is my favorite artist, and this is pretty much universally agreed to be his magnum opus, and, I mean, it's not like I disagree. Now, to be completely clear, Billy Joel isn't my favorite musical artist for any reason that's particularly deep-rooted or profound. He's simply an artist my parents love, who I heard in the car all the time growing up, and the more I looked into him as I grew up, the more I came to appreciate his persona and the wide variety of music he's gifted to us. Billy Joel is, simply put, the poster boy for how to be a middle-of-the-road artist properly, by having a very down-to-earth persona that's mostly humble and yet is still able to posture up from time to time, and focusing his music mostly around the changing trends of the time, but always with his signature piano to keep him anchored down. He's the artist I've listened to more than any other in my life, and while Scenes from an Italian Restaurant isn't my personal favorite song of his, that'd be a close race between You May Be Right, Leningrad, Down East or Alexa, and Allentown, yes, it's a four-way tie, shut up, I had to make some extremely painful cuts to even get it that low, I can still consider 
see that the Italian restaurant is something pretty special. Honestly, what I appreciate most about this song is that while it is a big spectacle in its own right, it really doesn't do anything fundamentally different from most other Billy Joel songs. Like, yeah, it's got a few Italian accordions sprinkled in there, and there's a bit more of a New Orleans kick than most of his stuff has. But at the end of the day, what makes this song so great is that it captures the feeling of finding a comfortable place you know well and just having a great night chatting, talking, and gossiping about days gone by. He makes this sound like a restaurant you would want to go to just for the great atmosphere and company you'd find. And honestly, the fact that this has gone on to become one of the most acclaimed songs of the 20th century goes to show me that Billy's core appeal as an artist is recognized and widely celebrated even to this day, which makes me very happy. And now let's hop back into some top patron requests. <laughs> How the hell did it take eight episodes of this show for someone to finally suggest Russian hard bass? I mean, this has been the internet's favorite meme genre for years, and this is the poster child for the genre. This really shouldn't have taken this long. When I hear the words mosh pit, this is the exact thing that plays in my head. This is pure, uncut rave music of the most aggressive, primal, aggro variety, and it kind of speaks for itself. This song is to acid what the next episode is to pot, and all I have to say is that if you're not listening to this with a woofer capable of tricking a seismograph into thinking an earthquake is happening, you're not doing it right. Cars are still on fire like I dreamt of It's a perfect way to ride a new parole Let me give some lyrics and I shall know it's real I don't know if there's an official name for the genre of music that sounds like the opening to a critically acclaimed laid-back slice of life anime, but if this song has taught me anything, it's that that particular genre works really well when you throw a house beat under it. This is an offering from Free Tempo, a Japanese DJ who puts a lot of emphasis on traditional instruments in his work, and yeah, this one definitely uses some really nice piano melodies, which isn't something I'm used to hearing in-house. This is one of those songs that doesn't really ask much of you as a listener, it just lets you glide along and enjoy the ride. I almost feel like too many standout qualities would kind of take you out of the pleasant joy ride you're on here. Although I will know that there is some really cool ear-catching bass work on display. You know, I'm tempted to tear hard into this one, since I'm pretty sure this is the song that's getting all my videos struck down for copyright, but I do think there is actually something worth discussing in John Cage's 433. Naturally, this one does draw some acoustic comparisons to a very good song by Samir Mizrahi. The fundamental difference is that one was a bit more mainstream utilitarian in its design. John Cage in this piece is asking you more to appreciate the virtues of silence and the natural ambient sounds that make up the subtle background rhythms in the world around us. The music video opens with an insistence that quote, everything we do is music. And she goes on to show that through allowing us to sit in our own sounds and merely appreciate the purity of the things we take for granted around us every day. A truly a moving piece, which I hope certain people, uh, particularly certain groups on Twitter, definitely choose to cover. It's not just me. I know you feel in the same way. not expect anything consumer friendly from a band called Let's Eat Grandma, who apparently described themselves as experimental sludge pop, especially not when they decided to bring on Sophie as a producer, and yet here we are. It's not just me, it isn't a normal pop song necessarily, there are some peculiar vocal layering choices and it's a bit too freeform for average mainstream sensibilities, but I could definitely see something like this crossing over through the TikTok market, and if a song following in Sophie's legacy ever does cross over, I imagine it'll probably sound a lot like this. Even beyond that though, this is just a really sweet little thing. I listened to it when I was feeling pretty shitty and down on myself, and uh, it made me feel not alone, which I really appreciated. <laughs> So apparently Blind Guardian were, like, one of the original power metal bands, some of the first guys who took a look at the fledgling metal scene and said, you know what, let's hit this fast and hard as fuck and make it sound epic as shit, which naturally led us into the glorious age of symphonic metal, which has probably one of the highest rates of turning out epic music of any genre I've ever heard. So yeah, we owe a lot to Blind Guardian, and while this track may be the closer to what's commonly called their darkest album ever to that point, it really does end on a high note, giving a masterclass in classic speed metal affects. Not a ton to specific points to comment on. It's definitely a bit dated these days, but in a cool vintage kind of way. It definitely bears returning to. Oh, 
not a ton to say about this one, honestly. It's kind of a throwback to that turn of the 90s era of alt-rock, you know, similar to the Stone Roses scene we discussed in the last episode, but with some more distinctive synth elements to it. This is one of those songs that just glides and drifts along, kind of droning in a way that just lets you fade into its vibe. The requester says this is a fantastic night-driving song, and I can definitely see that. Not because it's super propulsive or exciting, you're not bushwhacking your way through the darkness with this one, it's more just a song for when the world around you is peaceful and serene, and you're just flying through it and admiring the beauty. It's a very cerebral kind of night driving music, and there's definitely a place for that. Be damned. I constantly heard people go on and on about how Sarah Bareilles is a legit good artist who really doesn't deserve to be judged by her pop sellout stuff, and I kinda had a difficult time believing that, but yeah, I guess I'm eating my words now. I never would have expected a song like this from her. I won't lie and say this is particularly to my taste. A five-minute song performed half an acapella with these long, drawn-out syllable runs stringing together a wistful look at the loss of childhood nostalgia isn't something I'd ever really find myself working out, but she does sound absolutely beautiful here, and she really does manage to paint a scene with the minimal lyrics she does choose to include. When people talked about this woman, I assumed they meant she'd made good pop music, the best of which just didn't get big, but yeah, no, this is different, and this is good. <laughs> I didn't know they added new music discs to Minecraft. I mean, that must have been a daunting task. They've got a lofty pedigree to live up to considering the original C418 soundtrack of Minecraft is one of the primary characteristics that gives the game its identity, so tampering with the music of the biggest and most beloved video game of all time is definitely a risk, and yet Lena Rain pulled it off. This piece takes the rough, abrasive edge of dubstep, shaves it off, and sprinkles it all over this really slinky synth brass piece that definitely has a different vibe to the original Minecraft disc, but still fits in really well and has a lot of cool spiraling chord progressions that keep it engaging the whole way through. This one slaps hard, which is not something I'm used to saying about Minecraft music, and I'm glad that now I have a chance. <laughs> I have to say, this is exactly what I would imagine a song called Go made by the Midnight City guys would sound like, and I mean that in the best possible way. This is the kind of song that feels like it should be played over the end credits of a really great movie. It just gives you a feeling that something is over, but it was such an amazing experience that you can't help but be elated by all the amazing things you just experienced. This is thanks to both the incredible guitar work as well as the vocals from French Vietnamese indie chick Mai Lan, who has a very soft and pleasant but still ear-catching voice. It blends together to create a song that isn't exactly a hype track, but still has an incredible incredible power to uplift. Big thumbs up from me on this one. I just want to break the mold to not follow a path. But every week my life involves mentioning I've made no secret of my admiration for Scott the Waz. He's one of my favorite YouTubers on the platform, and I genuinely believe he's pushing the genre of pop culture media discussion forward on YouTube in a lot of ways. Very rarely have I ever found someone who's able to be that entertaining while maintaining such high production values and a consistent upload schedule. And so when he decided to make a grunge rock song as part of his hour-long 200th episode celebration, I can't say I was even surprised. All I could do was clap, not the least of which is because he actually pulled it off. The lyrics are typically goofy, nerdy, Scott Ferrer. You'll laugh if you know the context, but they're kind of nonsensical outside of it. But the music by frequent collaborator Garrett Wilson is a win regardless. Aside from the nerdy white boy speak rapping, this sounds like it could be a legitimate grunge song. And the melody, despite sounding suspiciously similar to La 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 by BB No Money, is still catchy enough to get stuck in your head for days. This is way better than it has any right to be, but hey, that might as well be Scott the Walsh's catchphrase at this point. We're tearing up this place tonight. We're gonna set this sleepy town alive. There are very few things I respect more than someone who puts the full weight of their creative muscle into children's entertainment, taking it as a point of pride to create something truly thoughtful and engaging for a young audience that you can show basically any old shit and they'll eat it, but you want to show them something great. And one of many excellent examples of this from the past decade was the 2009 CBBC smash hit Horrible Histories. This was a sketch comedy show meant to entertain kids while teaching them about the darker side of history in a reverent, hysterical way, taking inspiration 
from classic British sketch comedies to do so, and including song parodies such as an Eminem-style rap about King Charles II, a Cleopatra pastiche of Lady Gaga, or in this case, a glam metal ballad from the point of view of Viking Raiders. You'd think that songs like this coming out of a kid's show would be kind of stupid, but no, this is genuinely hysterical, and not only do they have the glam rock aesthetic and sound down perfectly, but saying shit like, we're tearing up this place and setting this town on fire, while the background singers inject literally after every line, it's the absolutely ideal amount of stupid, and when you seamlessly mention a bunch of trivia about when, where, and how the Viking raids actually happened throughout, I mean, you've got it. Perfect. No notes. Back to the main vote. <laughs> Following up from that last one, I have to say that one of the most impressive things that any musical act can do is make a joke song that's actually worth listening to more than once. And if I had to pick a single song that's right up there with Weird Al, Bo Burnham, and Flight of the Conquers in that category, it would have to be The Bad Touch by the Bloodhound Gang. Coming from their 1999 breakthrough album Hooray for Boobies, which by the way is a great name for any general purpose thing up to and including a comedy rap album, this song was their big breakthrough hit, nearly hitting the Billboard Top 50 right at the turn of the millennium, but being so singular and unforgettable that it's long outlasted many of the songs it shared the charts with. Seriously, a song like Fortunate by Maxwell was one of the biggest hits of that year, and yet if you asked a random sampling of people which song they remembered more, Fortunate or The Bad Touch, I think we both know which would win out there. I guess that just goes to show that chart placement isn't everything. But anyways, yeah, the song is great. Production-wise, it's a pretty standard genre mash of the time with both alt-rock and rap-rock ideas fused in, but not only are the deliveries of the lyrics dorky and understated in a, in a really amusing way, but all the innuendos they managed to cram in there, pun very much intended, are really intricately written and hysterical. Let me just read you a few bars from this song out loud. Love, the kind you clean up with a mop and bucket, like the lost catacombs of Egypt, only God knows where we stuck it. Hieroglyphics, let me be Pacific, I want to be down in your South Seas, but I got this notion that the motion of your ocean means small craft advisory. Not only are those lines genuinely hysterical, but the way they all link together and just keep building on top of each other is utterly fantastic. So many comedy songs fall into the trap of just saying nothing naughty words and making innuendos and having that be the extent of the joke, and so a song like this that actually cares enough to use a fine-tipped lyrical paintbrush to intricately illustrate a scene so utterly ridiculous is something that I can't appreciate enough. This song has gone down in history as an all-time classic in the realm of novelty songs, and I can't agree with that assessment enough. This is great. <laughs> So, this song should have been one of the biggest hits of 2016, and I have absolutely no idea why it wasn't. I mean, that's a lie. I do know why it wasn't. It was the seventh single off of a two-year-old album. The fact that it made it close to the top 40 at all is the real miracle. But I just don't get why this wasn't one of the first singles Taylor dropped off the album. I don't care if it's because it was only on the deluxe edition. The song is good enough that it deserved better regardless. Well, uh, okay, let's not oversell it too much. This isn't some legendary masterpiece or anything, but I do think it's a really solid anthemic banger that has a lot of appeal. I'd venture to say that this is probably the catchiest pop hook that Taylor Swift has ever come up with. Even though it wasn't that big a hit, you'll still never forget it after hearing it just once. And beyond that, this was Taylor's big swing at synth pop, and damn it, she did a really good job at it. The opening of this kind of reminds me of the stuff that Panic would be doing a few years later, but improved substantially by that trademark Taylor Swift tightness and Max Martin polish. I wish I had more to say about the song itself, but honestly, besides the fact that it's just a huge, bombastic sing-along anthem to a generation of young lovers, there's not much to say about it. It's just self-evidently a really solid piece, even if it isn't a particularly special one. This was Taylor's last solo single before Reputation dropped, and so, in a way, this song seemed to be the final chapter of old Taylor's career, and I will say that this song does have a grand, celebratory vibe to it that really does fit that position. I would say this proves that Taylor Swift should do more synth pop, but considering that Me and You Need to Calm Down exist, eh, I think we should just appreciate this for what it is. Taylor's new cabin girl aesthetic is a perfect fit for her as she travels further and further into adulthood, so I think we should look forward to more of that and appreciate this for the sweet, well-made send-off that it is. And now, let's send off this section of votes and get back to some top patron requests. Oh, this is a 
interesting. What we have here is a classic Cure track, released in 1981 as a standalone single and based off the plot of a classic English children's book of the same name. Apparently, Charlotte Sometimes, published in 1969 by Penelope Farmer, is about a girl named Charlotte who travels back and forth between her time in 1918 while communicating with another girl through a diary. I'll be honest, I found the Wikipedia plot summary to be kind of confusing, and apparently it's also the third book of the trilogy, so yeah, I'm just gonna disregard any connections to the book and just judge the song as is. And what it is, is a classic Cure track that I personally found to be a bit too repetitive and melancholic for my taste, but I can see the appeal. This is right when goth rock was just splitting off from post-punk, and the Cure were at the forefront of that trend and show their propensity for dark, echoing, hauntingly huge-sounding tracks here. As repetitive as the structure may be, it really does succeed in capturing a sense of understated grandeur, like looking at the ruins of an old cathedral, with the ominous rumination of Charlotte's fright and misery over the losses she suffered. This is a strange one that I'm personally not really sure what the correct way to listen to is, but it's definitely cool. I need a hero. Apparently this requester once made a video ranking their favorite underrated animated villain songs and put this one at number one. Typically, I would say, what are you talking about? Everyone knows and loves this, why are you calling it underrated? But you know what? The song is so fucking awesome that no matter how much love it gets, it'll always be underrated. I've always found the original Holding Out for a Hero to be a bit wasted in the original Flash Dance, largely being played for laughs as the soundtrack to an epic game of chicken with a pair of tractors. Look, Flashdance is stupid, don't ask me. This cover not only matches the sheer bombastic scope of the Bonnie Tyler original, easily living up to the spectacular theatricality you'd expect in any Jim Steinman composition, but within the context of Shrek 2, this song is played totally straight, definitely having a few funny moments interspersed in there, but ultimately serving as an incredible hype track for Shrek's final rush to beat the clock and save Fiona. This song has always pushed the levels of cheesy Steinman epicness right up to the very limits of reasonability, and I can't think of a better film for to close out than Shrek 2. Nor can I think of a better song Shrek 2 could have ended with, and it fully cements the film's status as one of the greatest animated comedies of all time. Kudos to Jennifer Saunders, by the way. She's the fairy godmother's voice actress, and she absolutely slays this song like a dragon. Not something that just any old voice actor can do. It just needs a lot of love to thrive. Show the full taste and stay alive. My fit book goes well with chives. But doesn't go into beehives. Alright, so this is a bit of a landmark moment for this series because this is the first time I'm reviewing a song one of my patrons has a real life connection to. In this particular instance, this patron has decided to submit their own song. Now, let me just say this up front. If you're gonna submit one of your songs to this series, expect a completely honest review from me. I'm not gonna go easy on you just because you're my patron. And if I think your song needs work, I'm gonna be honest and tell you straight up. And this particular song does need some work, but it also does have some legitimate promise. Well, let me get the criticisms out of the way right up front. Front. My main problem was that the vocals were mixed too low and I had difficulty understanding quite a few of the lyrics, which is quite a bit of a problem considering that this is a comedy rap song. On top of that, I have to be honest, I don't really understand what the main joke is supposed to be here besides the words moist and pickle being funny together, which, I mean... Sure. Ordinarily, I would also criticize some of the offbeat flows, but this is a comedy rap song presented as largely a goof track. It kind of fits even if it does go a bit too far in places. Beyond that, I do think some of the lyrics here are amusing. I dare you to hear the line, it's abysmaler than a pinto bean without at least cracking a smile. And the beat is actually legitimately not bad. It's got a nice, languid, spacey vibe with a little cha-cha percussion that's a good fit for comedy rap. All in all, for a project made in your spare time, I found this to be an imperfect but still amusing little piece. Excuse me for for the honesty, I know I can be brutal But when someone to trade the rhythm He helps to be seal underground and here we have another case where I'm reviewing a song that this requester made themselves, in this case being the low-swinging Underground from Ben Eel's album A Matter of Love and Death. Same as last time, I'm giving my full honest thoughts here, and I'm going to start with a criticism. If I had one main recommendation for improving this song, it would be to talk to a producer and have them doctor the vocals a bit, because you're not a bad singer at all, your voice is expressive and ear-catching, but I really think you'd benefit from a bit of pitch correction. The vocals on here sound nearly completely unaltered, and there were a few spots where a note didn't quite land the way it should, or the pitch drifted a bit off-center. Furthermore, there were a few spots where the words slurred together a bit. I get what you were going for with the style of singing you used, but I think enunciating a bit more would be very helpful. However, when you put those issues aside, I can say that I honestly, no cap, really liked this one. I've been really critical lately of songs that drag on for too long with no reason, but this song had me fully engaged the whole time. The minimalist production is constantly shifting from section to section, and it all fits the dark, slinky atmosphere you're going for. Furthermore, and again, I mean this with full sincerity, you've got a 
really good year for melody and a real knack for finding lyrics that match your vibe. I've got more than one hook from this song stuck in my head as I'm writing this, and the lyricism is genuinely very good here. I can practically taste the salt dripping off these cuttingly spiteful bars you put together. Honestly, while I do think this song as presented is in need of more than a bit of polish, I think you've got a legitimately great frame here. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Fucking hell, where do I start with this one? Okay, so apparently this song is an ode to Luna, basically the moon goddess of the My Little Pony world, and it was originally released as a sweeping dance track by Eurobeat Brony in 2011 before this cover by Cat's Millionaire and Circuit Fry was released a few months later. I've reviewed a few songs from My Little Pony before, but this is the first song I've ever reviewed from the My Little Pony fandom, which, regardless of what you think of the show, I can say is one of the most genuinely creative fandoms I've ever come across, at least based on what I've observed as an outsider. I have to say, even divorce from any context of the show, doing an ulti grungish industrial cover of a Eurodance song is always going to be really interesting on the face of it, and I honestly think this is genuinely really cool. There's a lot of interesting vocal layering, and the lo-fi compression effects really lend a sense of nostalgic charm to it, and they actually manage to jam in a lot of genuinely catchy synth hooks into the mix, making this something of a sleeper delight that you don't fully appreciate until you've heard a good few times. It's a psychotic genre mash that's good in the ways that most imagined dragon songs are bad, and me saying that about an MLP fan song is pretty incredible. This here is Woke Up Older, another 2011 release, this time from pop-punk band The Wonder Years. This album has been held up as one of the essential releases of 2010's pop-punk, and based on this song, I can see why. Structurally, this is yet another song that doesn't really have special tricks up its sleeve, it's just doing the essentials, but it's doing those essentials very well. It definitely carries the musical spirit of pop-punk's golden age into the new decade. Backed up by a well-constructed narrative about how this guy is really feeling the weight of how much time he's been in this relationship now that it's coming to an end. This requester also wanted me to give special mention to the drums, which are in indeed excellent. They have a real nice fullness to them with a great tone, and they do their job at adding a fair bit of complexity to the song's undercarriage. Big shout out to drummer Mike Kennedy here. Nice work all around. I see people turn their heads and quickly look away Like a newborn baby It just happens every day Okay, so you're probably looking at the song and artist and thinking to yourself, wait, the Thousand Miles Girl did a cover of Painted Black? Oh, that's so random, I love it. Well, believe it or not, it's actually way better than that, because not only did Vanessa Carlton cover Painted Black, but it wasn't just a standalone or a goof. No, this was on her debut studio album, Be Not Nobody. That was one of the best-selling albums of 2002. It went platinum off the strength of a thousand miles, and so the million-plus people who bought this album expecting a collection of breezy pop delights wound up with a fucking Rolling Stones cover. That is fantastic. And the cover is also fantastic. Oh, well, okay, that's overselling it. It's nothing crazy. It's basically exactly what you would expect the Thousand Miles Girl covering Painted Black would sound like. But hey, it's a great song, and Carlton is a good vocalist with a particular gift for emotional expression. You can really tell that this is a song that speaks to her soul, and she's really letting those emotions flow through her to make this piece her own. If this doesn't sound like something you'd even remotely enjoy, it won't win you over, but I'd give it a solid pass if you are down to try it out. Lando. There have been a good few times where I've had people present me with what they say is one of their favorite songs of all time, and I either haven't agreed or just haven't had much to say about why, and I always feel bad when I have to do that, so I'm pleased to say that this is one case where I can definitely see why you love this one so much, because this kicks ass. This is an early track from Canadian-American alt-rockers Palais Royale, a band I don't know anything about, and I feel like I didn't learn that much about them through this single, but that's totally fine with me, because this isn't a song that really needs any context or setup, you just hop in and go. The lyrics are simple and to the point about how he's hurting from his breakup and lamenting that there are too many people in the world who haven't found love, and they back this up with a badass, soaring, Foo Fighters-esque alt-rock banger of an instrumental. This is yet another song that lays all its cards out onto the table and doesn't give me a ton to say, but finds the beauty in its simplicity to become an excellent version of what it is. Big thumbs up from me. <laughs> Baby, 
This is quite possibly the most obscure song I've ever talked about in this series, because according to this requester, this group, Birthday Sex, released two songs in 2013 and then disappeared off the face of the earth. And through my research, I wasn't able to find anything else about them either. I don't know who they are, I don't know what their deal was, I don't know why this group with 78 YouTube subscribers has a professionally made music video for one of their songs, it's all a fascinating mystery. Apparently this requester only discovered the song because it was recommended in a playlist of songs in one of Spotify wrapped micro genres called Escape Room, which is apparently made by artists like Charlie XCX, Death Grips, Ben Staples, Sky Ferreira, and more, and is meant to describe, and I quote, a kind of underground trap PC music indie-tronica activist hip-hop kind of thing. Basically, it's one of the least known songs in one of music's least known genres, which makes it all the more peculiar that it's really good. This requester says it's one of their favorite songs of the 2010s, and while I wouldn't go that far, I will say that this is some exceptionally intricate synth-pop production, and the lead vocalist strays into some strange directions against them, which leads to a very unorthodox chord pattern that's really intriguing. The lyrics, far as I can decipher them, tell the story about living some sort of unspecified alternative lifestyle with a partner and helping both you and them come to terms with accepting yourselves, maybe? I don't know, this is a very peculiar song, and I've never heard anything quite like it, but I did enjoy it a fair bit, and I implore you to take a listen to it and see what you think of it yourselves. Please leave comments with your thoughts on this one in particular, I'm very interested in what you guys think of this. Oh, fuck yeah, we got a banger here. This is German comedic metalcore band Eskimo Callboy, recently rebranded into Electric Callboy, with a track from last year called We Got The Moves. Apparently this band is known for doing absolutely ridiculous live shows and videos, and for having a comedic edge to most things they do. And what I appreciate about this song specifically is that it is very amusing, but not through any of the lyrics. No, this song is instead almost a mockingly over-the-top parody of the cliches of metalcore and post-hardcore, while simultaneously being a love letter to those same tropes, saying, you know what, all this hard core posing and posturing is fucking ridiculous when you take a step back from it. Not that that makes us love it any less. The synth line they start out with honestly sounds like it came from that Slavic train hard bass meme, and I have to imagine they were at least somewhat aware of it because the entire song seems like a love letter to the point where over-the-top ridiculousness meets shameless abandon. The band said themselves this was a lead single meant to build hype for the new album Through the Roof, and you know what? They accomplished that in spades. This was great. So I get out of Colorado And here we have another German band, this one a bit more accessible to the American mainstream, as evidenced by the fact that they actually did have a mid-level radio hit a few years back with Stolen Dance, you know, and I want you, we can bring it on the floor, never dance like this before, you know that one. I always thought Stolen Dance was a fine song, nothing I'd ever seek out, but at least on par with the rest of the Lumineers paved lane of indie pop they were following. The song was released from July of last year, and I mean, yeah, this scans is what I imagine the Stolen Dance guys are up to nowadays. They switched out their twinkly background synths with slightly more jagged ones, and the bouncy folktronica thing is kind of updated to a fuller western guitar line, which I kind of dig. I can tell this was a pretty transparent attempt to break out of their one-hit wonder mold by hitting in America again. I'm not sure why else you'd call a song Colorado, but as far as folktronica goes, this one has a nice little hook. The synth melody is nice and slinky and goes in some fun places. You know what? This one's good. Nothing special, but good. <laughs> If a song is well-constructed and well-performed enough, then the song will have the power to transcend the language barrier on the power of raw emotion alone. And this is the case of this particular song, Chana Morea, by Indian producer Preetam, with really exquisite vocals from Arijit Singh, who Americans will only recognize as being the one behind the sampled Indian vocals and the beat to Whoopty by CJ, but who is one of the biggest and most beloved singers in India and the most followed Asian solo act on Spotify. The requester said they picked this song because it's somewhat recent and popular, and it has a nice blend of modern and classical elements typical of Indian pop music, and I honestly do think that blend between modern and classical instrumentation greatly contributes to the vast, sweeping scope of this song. It feels like a grand musical statement where all the instruments throughout all eras of history are coming together to back up this man as he pours his heart out to the one he has to leave and who he hopes will remember him fondly. It's an incredibly moving piece that tugged at my heartstrings even before I looked up the translation, and once I did, I found that the yearning heartbreak and hopeful longing of the lyrics had already been so expertly delivered through the vocals and instrumental sweep that I didn't really even need the translation. Huge thumbs up from me. This is some expertly made music right here. And now, back to the main vote. Rock 
Robin Schultz is one of the more under-discussed personalities in music of the 2010s, one of the first guys to really get in on the ground floor of the whole house boom, which would really define pop music of the last half of the 2010s, although his stuff was less tropical house and more deep house with more traditional riffs and funk influences. Although none of his hits were massive crossover stateside, they still got a fair amount of radio play and had a tendency to get stuck in your head when you heard them because of how completely distinctive they were. I can't think of anyone else who would take a depressing dirge about how the world was collapsing in on itself in a typhoon of destruction and environmental catastrophe and remix it into one of the biggest dance into the entire decade, and that's the same logic applied to this song, Sugar. This was, naturally, a remix of Sugar Sugar by Baby Bash, one of the biggest crossover rap hits of the 2000s, and this song does a great service by cutting Baby Bash out of the mix and leaving us with a slinky guitar line in the hook, which, I mean, yeah, Sugar How You Get So Fly was one of the most iconic lines in pop music of the 2000s, and so it totally makes sense to reuse it here. However, rather than trying to force it into a rap format like the original, this song instead takes that iconic hook and blends it into well, pretty much every other Robin Schultz song you've ever heard, being low-key, breezy, and wistful while also being intensely catchy. Honestly, Robin Schultz is kind of the poster child for what you want disposable radio songs to be, distinctive and memorable while not being too in your face, so that you're able to appreciate them while also listening to them hundreds of times in the background without getting sick of them. This little corner of the dance music scene is an underappreciated aspect of 2010's pop music, and I hope the influence of Robin Schultz echoes proud and strong in the EDM scene moving forward. <laughs> gonna lie, I didn't think this one was gonna live up to the hype. I first heard about this song when the Mode Reviews talked about it in one of his rankings, and ever since then it spread around my group of friends like Wildfire, quickly gaining the reputations of one of the best songs to hit it big in any major music market in a long time, and yeah, the hype is real with this one. It is, in fact, one of the best hit songs I've ever heard. I mean, first of all, it just sounds different from everything else, being this jangly indie heartland thing that reminded me of Castle on the Hill by Ed Sheeran in a lot of ways, not the least of which in that this guy has clearly listened to his fair share of U2, which is of course by no means a bad thing, I'll take upbeat soaring grandeur any day of the week. Vocally, Sam Fender isn't anything particularly special, he sounds like a ton of other mid-level British folk artists, but he is exceptionally good at taking the lyrics he wrote and selling them, really making you feel like he's putting his entire life into his words, and that's because, yeah, that's exactly what he's doing. Because this song is a devastatingly powerful ode to good, innocent people who are crushed and torn apart under the weight of a system that encourages people to fight for what is right and then punishes them for doing so, and who try to work hard and make an honest living, only to find that society has an unnerving tendency to kick those who were down harder than anyone else. Fender goes off hard here and pulls no punches, starting with how he was exposed to snuff videos that desensitized him to the world as young as he could remember, being torn apart by guilt when he didn't stand up to bullies attacking his best friend, and then being hounded by cops for getting in fistfights in years afterwards, and how strange it is that we can all be so reluctant to throw punches, and yet we're able to hurt the ones we love the most so utterly effortlessly. He then goes on to talk about the nihilism that engulfed him as a teenager, how the world constantly beating down on him never gave him a chance to let his guard down, and when he considered dealing drugs to help his sick mother, she was destroyed at the idea that he even had to consider that, and holy shit, this song just does not let up. It takes every single contributing factor to why a young person might feel that the world is a dark, miserable place with no light at the end of the tunnel, and compounds them all on top of each other in a heartbreakingly powerful cry of frustration and grief. This is one of the realest songs I've ever heard. I cannot believe it hit the top five in the UK, and I can only hope that a crossover into the US isn't too far into the future, because everyone who's been calling this one of the best songs I've ever made are not lying. This is a damn masterpiece. And now let's hop back into some top patron requests. <laughs> Okay, so typically I try and do a bit of research to put these songs in context, but this requester was nice enough to write me an eight-paragraph essay on who this artist is and what she's about, so let me just summarize that real quickly. This is Addo, a 19-year-old Japanese pop star who broke onto the scene in late 2020 and is one of the most notable new acts of the current J-pop scene, most notable for her extensive collaboration with Vocaloid artists as her producers. This particular song was produced by three of those producers, including Vocaloid pioneer Giga, General Electronica guru Teddy Lloyd, and Deco Nina, one of the most successful Vocaloid masters of the past decade. 
Kid. This song is the climactic fusion of four of the most singular talents in Japanese pop music and serves as a crowning jewel of the dominance the Vocaloid scene has on the Japanese charts, as this was a top five hit. However, this requester did concede that the main reason they recommended it to me was that it slaps, which indeed it does. I completely buy that this is the collaboration between four distinct musical talents because it starts and then just goes absolutely everywhere, with horns, sitars, record skips, European hard bass, techno, dubstep, and arena rock trappings, and more hooks than you can even process. Honestly, it's a bizarre comparison, but what this song reminds me of the most is I Like It by Cardi B. A lot of incredibly distinctive musical flavors all blended together into a glorious celebration of genre mashing. I know the series has developed somewhat of a reputation for a lot of J-pop that I'm really not that good at discussing or distinguishing from each other, but trust me, one listen to this and you will never forget it. So I've looked at a lot of songs in grab bag reviews. We're going to pass the 300 mark and well beyond by the time this episode is over, and so I hope you don't take this lightly and realize the sheer weight behind these words when I say that World.Execute Me by Millie might just be my single favorite song that I've discovered through this series so far. Millie is a Japanese indie group best known for fusing classical music ideas with electronica and contemporary pop affects, and this song is from their 2016 album Miracle Milk. I have no idea what the rest of this group's work sounds like or if this is anything characteristic for them. All I know is that this is one of the most fascinating and brilliantly executed songs I've ever heard, telling the story of a sentient AI in a dystopian future that falls in love with a human using its program and vows to synthesize itself into all the necessary elements this human needs in order to survive and thrive within the simulation, with the standout line to me being, if I'm the only god, then you're the proof of my existence. God, that's such a fucking awesome concept for a song. I'm genuinely shocked I've never heard a song about a god falling in love with its creation before, and framing it to be from the perspective of a sentient AI makes it so much less abstract abstract and so much more utterly captivating. Of course, a great concept is nothing without the execution to back it up, and this song is a perfect, no exaggeration, perfect execution of that concept. From the lightning-fingered yet still subtle guitar work to the epic piano and bass swell as the love develops to the possessed, robotic yet ever-moving flow of the main vocalist that perfectly encapsulates the delivery I'd expect of a sentient AI learning to love. This is one of the best songs I've ever heard in my life, and I'm officially making it your homework to go check it out after this episode is done. I got my sexy pants on. I got my stretchy pants on Stand it like where you better work it for me It's amazing how much easier it is to stomach an unfunny joke song when you know that the person behind it is a legitimately talented artist with a ton of classics under their belt. I mean, even on her worst days, Carrie Underwood is a fantastic vocalist, and so hearing her do a light funk slash Christmas song about how grateful she is she's able to gorge herself on food over the holidays thanks to her stretchy latex pants letting her waistline expand. I mean, she sells it better than most people could. This is probably the best of the song with ad-libbed background vocalists going stretchy, stretchy over and over again probably could be. What you see is kind of what you get with this one. I imagine this one might give you a kick if you're in the demographic who enjoys stretchy pants, but personally, the last time I wore leggings in public, I'm pretty sure I got put on a list, so I'm just gonna let this one be what it is. You can probably tell from what you've heard in the background if this is the kind of thing you'll have any use for. <laughs> You guys do realize that voting in these 20 minute prog rock epics is basically cheating, right? Like, I know I said I would review any songs you guys give me, but this is literally just the entire front side of an album. They literally even have breaks between each of the seven parts. They're basically seven songs with a through line to them. But, eh, whatever. I said any song, and if Rush is gonna call this a song, I'm gonna judge it as a song, and it's a damn good one. Not really sure how to go about discussing why that is, because simply put, this is just Rush doing their thing for 20 minutes, jamming out in their classic prog rock way as they weave a winding story, which I'm pretty sure is about a future society to discovering ancient alien technology, maybe? I'll be honest, I found it very hard to follow the plot for the full 20 minutes, and considering that Neil Peart said this song's story was, and I quote, inspired by the genius of Ayn Rand, yeah, I think I'm just gonna enjoy the band jamming out and leave it at that. The only real unique thing about it are a few breaks for weird sci-fi instrumental sound effects, and a few more dubbed over the zen-like rippling of flowing water. Besides that, you're not gonna find anything that out of the ordinary for Rush here. Apparently, this song was adapted into its own comic book, and yeah, I can see why. Like any Rush song, Song, it makes you see things. He's last for me to rise again. His misery wants to mend. 
man, I don't know what it was about this episode that caused so many people to finally hop over the line and submit their own stuff, but this is another case the requester has decided to submit their own song, and here's what I have to say. I know that a lot of you watching are into hard rock given how frequently it gets suggested on here, and if you were in that camp, I think Billy O'Brien is a new name worth looking into, because this was great. Uh, granted, on the level of composition, this isn't particularly special. I've heard a lot of high-tempo rock songs that sound like this, although this is a very good, well-produced version of that sound, and that solo in particular was nice and crunchy. Uh, furthermore, I did have a little bit of trouble understanding some of the lyrics. I think they could have been a wee bit higher in the mix, especially considering the Eddie Vedder vocal stylings you got there, but I was still able to understand enough of the lyrics to get the gist of it, and that's good, because the topic is what really put this over the top for me, since this is a rock song about the artist's frustration with religious organizations that shun LGBT plus people while claiming to preach love and acceptance. The title comes from the word blasphemy to the highest extent, referencing both what these organizations say about these marginalized people, as well as the singer's own thoughts on how God probably views these actions from his own followers. And again, while this isn't something particularly new or groundbreaking, you really do feel that righteous frustration seeping through. This was a really great surprise. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Honestly, shit like this is the exact reason I started this series, because never in a thousand lifetimes of talking about popular music in any sense of the word would I ever have an opportunity to talk about Greetings, an experimental lo-fi synthwave offering from YouTube animator Pilot Red Sun. I had never heard of him before this video, but I looked into some of his animations, and I think the best way to describe him would be Microsoft Paint rotoscoping run through one of several distortion filters. I've never seen anything quite like it. And that's a rare compliment when I'm able to say a style I found on YouTube is totally unique. I found a comment under one of his videos quoting the man himself saying when an animation contains an error, it distracts the viewer. Thus, when an animation is composed of errors, it mesmerizes the viewer. And while that's an excellent way to describe the appeal of his animations, I also think that's the same principle guiding the creation of his music. This isn't trend chasing in any sense of the word. He's not just making lo-fi synthwave because that's what's big on YouTube. He comes at it from a slightly uncanny angle, with chord structures and riffs that are just different enough from common standards that you can't get them out of your brain. And I, for one, find it, just like his animation, to be absolutely absolutely mesmerizing. Holy shit, this is one of the coolest ideas I've ever seen. This is Zeal and Ardor, a Swiss band that gained prominence in 2016 with the album this song came from, whose entire thing is, no joke, combining black metal with traditional slave hymns, which it turns out is one of the most incredible combinations of things in the world because this is ridiculously good. I can't even get my head around it. Apparently this idea came about because lead singer Manuel Gagno was promoting his chamber pop demos on 4chan and asking people for random genres he should combine as an exercise, and when black metal and slave spirituals came up together, he loved the results so much that he decided to just do that full time. He said the sound of the band was inspired by the question of, what if American slaves had embraced Satan instead of Jesus? and it turns out that the result is one of the hardest bangers ever put to vinyl. Traditional slave spirituals are the root of a massive percentage of American musical genres, including but not limited to gospel and the blues, which of course then spun off to form bluegrass, country, jazz, R&B, and rock and roll. And since black metal is basically pushing rock and roll to the furthest extremes it can possibly go, combining the two together is like connecting two ends of this long chain of musical evolution, and it goes to show that they clearly still share a lot of the same DNA. This particular song is definitely more spiritual than metal. The chanting of the riverbed running red with the blood of the saints is the structure that the metal elements are built off of, but they both speak to something very raw, deep, and intense within the human spirit, and it all comes together to create one of the coolest things I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Even though I've only reviewed a single song from each of them in this series, something tells me I'm eventually going to wind up reviewing the entire soundtrack to both Undertale and Deltarune in this series. I'll be frank, I haven't played either game. I don't even know what Deltarune's relationship to Undertale is. If it's directly related to the game or just has a lot of aesthetic similarities, I don't know. But in any case, both game soundtracks are composed by the same guy who did the entire rest of the game, Toby Fox, and this man is damn good at his job. Apparently this is the main theme for Deltarune's second chapter, and it's meant to convey the feeling of exploring a cyber world 
world, and I think it does a great job at it, being a jaunty, bouncy little tune that invites a sense of wonder and scope without being too overwhelming, particularly through the use of the choir synths backing up and elevating it. That's something I've always found interesting about Fox, how so many of his compositions are primarily chip tunes, but then they add modern instrumentation on top of them without losing the characteristic rigidness of those chip tunes. It's hard to explain, but it leads to a very charming effect, which is in full force here. Maybe this is what I get for leaving you out in the rain. Pop the trunk and drop my body in the grave. Throw a shovel, let me out and dig a grave. Put the pistol to my ear, I heard it say in the black on black, on the white on white. It's always cool when I get introduced to a new content creator who just happens to make music and I instantly end up hitting subscribe, but that's what happened with Nakey Jakey, a YouTuber coming up on 1.8 million subscribers who mostly seems to do discussion videos on a wide variety of pop culture topics, primarily gaming, and who also seems to be doing his own take on Joji and pulling it off pretty damn well. Released out of a year hiatus, this is an achingly heartbroken alt-indie piece with some pretty direct introspective lyrics about reflecting on the immense power he has over the object of the song's focus, and how his abuse of that power led to him losing everything. Naturally, there's a lot to read into here, the mere question of whether the entire song is purely introspection on his own psyche or if it's about another person vastly changes how you're reading it, and the line of it doesn't matter what you wear when you die is an immensely powerful wham line that chillingly goes almost without emphasis in this torrent of emotion. Definitely a lot to unpack here and certainly worth your listen. I first heard about Neil Cicerega's Mouth series of mashup albums through Quentin Review's video on the man's entire internet career, where he said, to paraphrase, that Cicerega's mashups are like the alternate universe version of popular songs that exist in your memory, which you like better than the original. That's definitely true for the series' biggest viral success, Bustin', which remixes the original Ghostbusters theme into a novelty track built upon the universal truth I just invented that Bustin' makes me feel good is an absolutely hysterical sentence. It's such an incredibly simple idea. It's a joke that you make with your friends at a bar that y'all get a kick out of and then forget about but Neil has captured this jolt of sophomoric lightning in a bottle, taking the genuinely fun and infectious kick of the original Ray Parker Jr. song and recontextualizing it into a joke so simple and wonderful that it seems like it's always been there. Honestly, I think that specific talent, the ability to take goofy gaffes on pop culture that should start and end at being an inside joke and bring them into the world in their best possible form, is the reason why Cesarega is basically the godfather of the internet at this point. So may we start! And just like I love when a song makes me immediately subscribe to the YouTube channel of the person making it, I also love when a song is the theme song to a movie and my first thought upon listening to it is, okay, I have to know the context. I am watching this movie. Annette is a 2021 Adam Driver film that's the first English release of noted French director Leos Carex. And as of now, I've only read the film's Wikipedia summary, which says that it's a rock opera about a stand-up comedian and an opera singer whose lives are radically shifted when they have a child. Pretty standard stuff. However, when you hear this song, either within the film as the cast marches down the street and directly addresses the audience asking for their attention and permission to begin the film, or on the official recording where the band emulate that same effect, well, it's definitely attention-grabbing. I'll also add that it's a very catchy tune in its own right. I know Lin-Manuel Miranda has a really cliché thing to compare, well, pretty much anything to, but that is what the melody and chord progression reminded me of. And with the distinct chanting and operatic sections, that comparison seems even more apt. I wish I could be a girl in that way you wish I could be a girlfriend, boyfriend. fuck did I put in the water to get you guys to submit so many fucking awesome bangers from so many fascinating angles and made by so many fascinating people? This song is from Will Wood, another Neil Cicerega type who just seems to go wherever the fuck he wants to, making art along the way and asking for nothing in return but respect for his privacy and maybe a Patreon subscription if you're feeling spicy. Not only is this song a beautiful cluster of every sound you can imagine, with my best description of it being that it sounds like a Sophie remix of Crocodile Rock, but the lyrics, beyond being incredibly well woven, address a really touchy subject in a really thoughtful, caring way with a lot of good humor to boot. While this song has naturally been picked up as an anthem for all corners of the LGBT spectrum, with trans people in particular, Will himself is cis, and this song seems to be about his frustration with people calling him less of a man just because he wears makeup and cross-dresses. He says that he's comfortable being a man despite the traditionally non-masculine things he enjoys, and that the ultimate goal of anyone should be to find comfort in their own identity, whatever that may be, and to not let anyone put you into boxes of any kind. Anyone who takes a message of that universal uplifting and delivers it in such a maniacally entertaining way while mixing in lines like if the shoe fits I won't try it on and am I pretty enough to lie to has my undying respect. And on the subject of songs that have my undying respect... <laughs> I'm 
I first became aware of System of a Down's existence in high school because one of my friends was really into them and he told me that the band's lead singer was named Serge Tankian, which is, and this is an objective fact, one of the most awesome names of any human being on the planet. I remember listening to some of their songs and I was impressed and thought they were cool, but I didn't really return to them all that much. This was probably around 2013, so I don't know which album it was, but I do know for a fact that it wasn't Chop Suey, because this is not a song that you forget once you hear it. The song actually made some headlines recently by becoming the first metal song to pass a billion views on YouTube, just barely beating out Nothing Else Matters by Metallica. And while it's kind of amazing to me that a song like this has become such a pop culture touchstone, it's one of those things where I'm just so incredibly glad that the public has broader taste than so many give them credit for. System of a Down are obviously a militantly political band, being one of the only forces in mainstream American culture that actually bothered to stand up against the Bush administration's warmongering as well as the war on drugs and basically every other taboo topic you can imagine. But this song became their signature song not only because of the incredibly forceful delivery of that start-stopping hook, which is obviously completely unforgettable, but also because it's quite possibly the most universal of their songs topic-wise, talking about the stigmatization of those dealing with mental and systemic problems. Guitarist and songwriter Darren Malakian has said that the song's most famous line, I cry when angels deserve to die, is about how society often deems its undesirable, such as drug users, homeless people, and those suffering from sexually transmitted diseases, are often not mourned when they pass because they, quote, deserve to die because of the lifestyles they led, and how fucked up it is that society fails to help these people out of their lowest points and then scoffs at them when they don't end up making it. Put on your makeup and pretend you're in a better place than you are, and don't get tempted by the easy out of suicide, not the least of which is because if you do go that way, you'll be seen as a failure and a traitor to the good society. It's obviously an incredibly heavy song that deals with some incredibly difficult emotions, and yet it also strikes an ideal balance between being forceful, in-your-face aggressive, and somber and reflective, drawing you in and refusing to let you not confront the hypocrisy that you yourself might practice in your life. It's an incredibly moving song, and I can easily see why it's regarded as one of the greatest metal tracks of all time. Gentlemen, I present to you Don't Speak by No Doubt, the single biggest song of the 1990s. I hear some of you saying, Sean, what are you talking about? This song never even touched the Hot 100. How is this the biggest? No, no, shut up. Listen to me. This was the biggest song of the 1990s. Just because Billboard's bullshit rules didn't allow this song to chart since it didn't have a vinyl release, that doesn't mean this wasn't the biggest song of the decade. It smashed every airplay record in existence, it's one of the most widely recognized songs in the country, and it propelled the album it came from to be one of the best selling of the entire decade. In every way except Hot 100 success, Don't Speak by No Doubt is the biggest song of the 1990s, and frankly, it's not difficult to see why. Don't Doubt is often typecast as a ska band, and that's because they were. They ushered in a huge revival of the genre, and you can trace a direct lineage back to them from pretty much any white pop stars in the modern day that co-opt Caribbean rhythms for their music. But to say that that's all they were is a misnomer. They could lay on a heavy coat of alt-rock if they wanted to, to which their biggest hit is a testament. Don't Speak, on the face of it, is a pretty straightforward breakup song. It was actually originally written by Gwen Stefani's brother is an upbeat 70s rock song, but after going through a rough breakup, Gwen took the lyrics and reworked them into the song we see today, which is about a breakup on the face of it, but ultimately serves as a universal testament to pretty much any situation where someone knows bad news is coming and is bracing for the impact while wishing in vain that it wasn't coming. Honestly, that universality extends beyond the lyrics, because while they were relatable as all hell, I think the reason this song was so massive was because it ticked pretty much every genre box imaginable for 90s pop music. The female-led alt-rock vibe got it in good with the Lilith Fair crowd, it's heavy enough to get into heavy rotation on most other rock stations, Gwen's high and sweet semi sweet vocals plus the band's previous pop grad was enough to get it into heavy rotations on the pop stations, it just did a great job appealing to pretty much everyone without watering down the core appeal. No doubt and producer Matthew Wilder knew what song they wanted to make and they made the best version they could of it, and the fact that what they wanted to make happened to be so universally appealing worked out very well in their favor. No doubt and Gwen Solo would spend the rest of their careers trying to recapture this song's lightning in a bottle, but frankly this is a single wonderful moment in music history that I don't think is ever going to be replicated in quite this way again. So let's simply let it be what it is and move on to some top patron requests. Everyone losing 
their mind over Numb Little Bug rising up the charts, I guess it's no surprise that this song, which is basically the electro-indie pop rock version of that from 23-year-old Norwegian singer-songwriter Marie Ringheim, better known as Girl in Red, has captured so many imaginations. This was apparently one of the biggest rock airplay hits of the last year, and I can see why, since not only is it a basic but effective indie pop song in its own right, but it does a very good job capturing the same intrusive, pounding, headache thoughts of depression that Numb Little Bug does. Not quite as charming as that song, but still very effective. One thing I love about this song in particular is the line, there's no depth to these feelings, which is an aspect of depression I don't see discussed enough. Not only can your head get filled with awful thoughts about self-harm and destruction, but you know these thoughts are fleeting and pointless, so not only is your brain filled with negativity, it's filled with inane chatter about nothing, which is completely maddening in its own right. This is an impressive piece, and I'll be on the lookout for more from Girl in Red moving forward. No flex zone, no flex zone, they know better, they know better. I know, the city it be for the crap, plastic, pretty women hear my knuckles crack. Though, as it turns out, the girl who made Broken Hearted back in 2012 wasn't rapping just for the hell of it, or because the label just asked her to, it turns out this is actually something she's really into. After Carmen disbanded in 2017, the duo's vocalist reinvented herself into a rapper named Queen Herbie, and has just been dropping hip-hop and B-projects ever since then. As always, I'm more than a bit skeptical of any rapper whose primary skill is just how fast they can go, but I'm honestly willing to give her a bit more slack, because unlike your Joyner Lucases or your Logics, it doesn't seem like she's really trying to prove a point or prove that she's better than anyone else, she's just trying to have fun. This song touts itself as a remix of No Flex Zone, but it's really more of a remake, with nothing carried over except the hook, and even though it's literally a collaboration with one of the guys from epic rap battles of history, this somehow manages to be a pretty fun version of the whitest kids you know rapping, probably helped along by just how slick that locomotive cello line at the bottom is. Yeah, it's more than a bit awkward in places, they definitely didn't need to repeat the line ingrown hair as much as they did, but if you're willing to overlook the sheer lameness of the idea of Carmen covering No Flex Zone, I think you'll find that there actually is something here. Superficial feelings, it's hard to take it easy, underneath the red sun, everything's electric. Okay, did you guys know that Oasis fucking rules? Did you know that anything even tangentially related to Oasis also fucking rules? Did you know that Liam Gallagher is one of the best vocalists in rock history and that a song where he calls out the phonies and haters all around him with Dave Grohl of Nirvana and Foo Fighters fame backing him up as a recipe for absolute fucking gold? Well, uh, okay, maybe I'm overselling it a bit. This isn't top-tier Gallagher work. It's a bit unfortunate to see one of the last gods of rock and roll fall into the very modern trend of having the chorus be the weakest part of the song sonically, pulling back and having a more minimalist instrumental as opposed to the grand epic scope of the vocals, that seems like more of an all-time low trick than an Oasis one. It doesn't really matter much. This is a Noel Gallagher song where the world is huge, grand, and on fire, and he's the only one who's capable of leading us onward out of the insanity, and that's where he shines the brightest, so there's only so much I can complain. So is it okay if I swear I'm not Mercedes now? Cause I know you'll be somewhere around town. Doesn't solve any problems, I doubt you know what you've done, so I hope you run out of diesel on the motorway. Man, why the hell is this the specific episode where everyone decided to request their own music, or in this case, their sister's music, as Rachel Carey is in fact this requester's sister? Apparently Rachel has an upcoming EP and they're looking to build some buzz for it, and that it's recommended for the Billie Eilish, Olivia Rodrigo, upbeat bedroom pop crowd, and yeah, if you've enjoyed literally anything either of those two girls have put out in the past three years, I definitely recommend giving this one a listen too, because this is fantastic. It's definitely following in the footsteps of the big lyrical trend of pop girls absolutely manslaughtering their exes, and this one does it with fashion and flair while sprinkling some industrial lo-fi indie trappings over a really jaunty synthy banger. This really is one of those songs that you seek out just to revel in the pure joy of cutting someone shitty out of your life. Beyond Olivia and Billy, I also sense a good bit of caravan palace energy in this, with some of the cool warbly distortion effects and the uplifting vibe approached from a slightly off-kilter but still very accessible angle. Definitely a cool piece here. I know the audience this channel has, and I honestly think you guys will love Rachel Carey's music if this song is any indication. H to the is O, P to the is A, that's the anthem, get your damn hands up. H to the is O, P to the is A. And going from a song that most of you probably don't know, but definitely should, to a song that you probably already do know, and that you should definitely listen to again, because it's great. Believe it or not, the best hit songs of 2001 list is still on my schedule. I just need to work around Ethan's schedule to get it done, and now that the world isn't on pause anymore, that schedule is significantly more complicated. But for now, you can take solace in the fact that if this song doesn't wind up on the proper list, it's gonna be a really close thing. This song is just about as classic as you can get, being a warm, inviting cut from Jay-Z's Golden Age, built over a sweet-ass Kanye beat that rearranges want you back by the Jackson 5 into one of the best beats of the era. I'm typically not as big on Jay as most other people, but that is not this song's fault. This is still a gem. Monster, how should I feel? Creatures lie here, looking through the window. It's really fun. 
funny when you think about how many songs are completely and totally defined by remixes that get big and blow up to the point where the intent of the original is completely lost, and considering that the Nightcore dubstep remix of Monster by Megan Dia is one of the most definitive electroclash staples of early 2010s internet culture, it feels worthwhile to take a step back and appreciate the original grungy pop-punk song for the nice little piece it is. In an era where the Veronicas were one of the biggest names in the scene, it's genuinely moving to see these lyrics tackle the subject of illegitimate children who were cast out without any real family structure to lean on, seen as metaphorically unloved monsters by everyone involved in their conception far too often. It's a haunting song that deserves to stand on its own right and doesn't deserve the overshadowing it's gotten. Something to be said for a good, solid country song that's just fundamentally really strong in all aspects, even if there's nothing particularly noteworthy about it otherwise, and that's certainly the case for Maddie and Tay's Strangers, which is apparently this requester's favorite song off their most recent EP, and for damn good reason. You'll probably recognize Maddie and Tay for their breakthrough anti-bro country hit Girl in a Country Song from back in 2015, or possibly Die from a Broken Heart from back in 2020, both similarly great songs that excel at the fundamentals, and this piece right here about how it feels like they've known their partner forever and it's impossible to leave that they were ever strangers because of just what an irreplaceable fixture in their life he's become is just a really cute, wholesome message. And when you couple that with a delicate yet still powerful background instrumental and the girl's beautiful voices, you got a really nice piece here. Definitely worth your time. And the moment I slept I was swept up in a terrible tremor. Though no longer bereft, how I shook and I couldn't remember. Sometimes songs get suggested for grab bag reviews where I will fully admit that I am not capable of giving them the full justice that they deserve, where I can certainly give my opinions on what I heard, but those opinions are still largely based on first impressions for a song that truly requires time to ferment and mull over before you get to the full scope of it. And the centerpiece song of Joanna Newsom's 2006 magnum opus Wise is one of those songs. This is a 10 minute harp and vocal piece where Newsom weaves an honest to god epic poem that goes around so many loops and down so many metaphorical rabbit holes that I'm honestly having a hard time getting my head around it. The Genius page says it's about the grief brought about by losing a child, and when I step back and actually read the lyrics, I can certainly see that subtext, but I'm honestly so brought in by the angelic heart playing and Newsom's peculiar but utterly captivating voice that I don't really want to analyze it, I just want to let it wash over me. The requester says that it's the song that calms them down whenever they're dealing with anxiety and sensory overload, and I can certainly see why. This is a genre I'm not typically into, but I was mesmerized by this first listen, and I'll certainly be returning to it to see what else I can take from from it. Never change, never change, never change, never change. This song used in a commercial or something because this is incredibly familiar. It says on Wikipedia it was on the FIFA soundtrack, but I've never played a FIFA game in my life, so eh, I don't know. Maybe I'm just remembering this sounding like the background music to some sort of tutorial video or something, because to be totally frank, this kind of sounds like stock background music, at least in the production. It's definitely taking inspiration from the very early 80s synth pop era where people still weren't totally used to synths, and so they slowly dipped their toes into the water and tried a couple light motifs, you know, before Duran Duran came around and showed everyone that blasting your ears with a full fire hydrant of synth can be profitable too. I don't know, I'm just rambling now. The long and short of it is that I found the song to be pretty repetitive and not all too engaging. I don't know much about LCD Sound System besides the fact that they have a very devoted following, so please don't take this the wrong way. I'm sure they have better stuff out there, but this one didn't really light me up. I already talked about Frightened Rabbit previously when I discussed Keep Yourself Warm in episode 6 of this show, and Owl John is the solo project of that band's lead singer, Scott Hutchinson. What I wasn't aware when I wrote that entry on Frightened Rabbit last time was that Hutchinson was no longer alive, having tragically taken his own life in 2018. And that certainly does paint what little music I've heard from him in a very different light. I've compared Keep Yourself Warm to a Scottish version of Five for Fighting, and oddly enough, the solo project actually has much richer and more textured background instrumentals. This particular song follows the under-the-bridge approach of asking the city to be kind to a wayward soul who needs someone somewhere to have his back, and considering what became of the man who made it, that certainly gives this song an intensely melancholic vibe about it. The vocals are as great as ever, and this is just a very moving ode to loneliness and dejection. Certainly worth your listen. Rest in peace, Scott. <laughs> If you're 
you're into music history, you most likely know the story of the Buggles, a duo best known for making video Kill the Radio Star, and which is composed of Jeff Downs, who would go on to become the keyboard player for Yes before co-founding arena rock supergroup Asia, and Trevor Horn, who would become the defining synth producer of the 80s and continue to be one of the most iconic and successful producers around well into the 2000s. This is a cut from the Buggles' second and final album, Adventures in Modern Recording, which was a bit more of a progressive electro-fusion album, with Vermillion Sands being a whole cocktail mix of cold, harsh synths, smoother jazz, off-kilter proggy organ solos, and everything in between. You can tell that Trevor and Jeff were just two guys who loved sound and loved to experiment and play around with it, and while no one is going to call this timeless, it is certainly a fascinating piece by some of the most influential men ever to grace the behind-the-scenes of the music industry, and it's worth a listen just for a brief glimpse into their crazy minds. Oh, I like to think I typically have enough self-awareness not to say, wow, this sounds a lot like Numb by Linkin Park whenever I hear a metalcore song, but, like... This one sounds a lot like Numb by Linkin Park. But it's only on the level of aesthetics, of course. The lyrical conceit is totally different, with this one actually being pretty uplifting in a sense, basically about trading in your humanity to weave yourself into a more unified code amongst others. A lot of various metaphorical ideas weaving in and out of each other, just as lead singer Chris Motionless weaves in and out of singing and screamo vocals with more dexterity than you typically hear in songs like this. This requester says they're glad the band didn't turn in a jarring or corny set of lyrics like they sometimes do, and I can definitely see that. They seem like they're writing right on the the edge of that line without tipping over it, and that's definitely admirable. Long story short, if you want a song that sounds like Linkin Park turned up a few notches with a notably different lyrical motif, this is definitely one worth checking out. And now, let's get back to the main vote. <laughs> Okay, let's get this out of the way first and foremost. Yes, if this song were eligible for the best hit songs of 1996 video I did with Liz last year, it would have been on that list and high. Unfortunately, because of the weird way that chart tracking worked for double A sides, Yellow Submarine did make the year-end list, but Eleanor Rigby just barely missed it. Any means of tracking the definitive list of the biggest hits of any given year is going to be imperfect, and the year-end lists are the best consistent record we've got, so we just have to live with it in this case. Fortunately, enough of you still want to know my thoughts on this, that it got voted into this episode, and pretty damn high, so what do I think of Eleanor Rigby? Same as everyone else, I think it's a masterpiece. I mean, were you expecting anything different? Aside from just being a great piece of art, I think Eleanor Rigby is important because, as far as I know, this song was basically the turning point for the Beatles' entire artistic trajectory. You gotta remember, when they first broke onto the scene, the Beatles were functionally a boy band. They were the buck-toothed pin-up hunks of their day who got the girlies screaming, and yet by the time they broke up, the fangirls had moved on, and yet they were still the biggest act around, topping the charts and selling millions of records. There had to be a point where the Beatles shifted from the idols of teenage girls everywhere into the singular, thoughtful band of hippies who turned pop music into an art form worthy of highbrow analysis, and I honestly think that Eleanor Rigby is that song. This was the double A-side with Yellow Submarine, a goofy novelty song for children, and yet it had a spare string quartet underscoring a parade of somber harmonies about a young woman with no friends and no future who died unmourned, and the lonesome priest writing sermons no one listens to who buried and blessed her to heaven because no one else would bother. Too lonely people, connected by fate, who never even knew each other existed. This was a level of frank darkness that was a shock to the public of 1966. You can go back and listen to our Best Hit Songs of 1966 list, and you'll find that nothing sounded anything remotely like this at the time, and yet it nearly cracked the top ten off of the Beatles' sheer star power. It's a haunting, eerie song that captured the hearts, and more importantly, the minds of millions. And it was the first step in the transformation of popular music into the art form it's recognized as today. Truly exceptional work. It's one of the most acclaimed songs in the catalog of the biggest and most important band in history for damn good reason. <laughs> that invented the banger? I think this might be the song that invented the banger. If it's not, then it certainly codified it into the language of popular music, because despite his lack of charting success, I can attest as someone who was 13 years old in 2010 that Skrillex was a god. This was THE guy. Dubstep was the thing all the cool kids were into. He was an icon, his ripoffs were ubiquitous, he absolutely owned the world, and I thought his music was the stupidest thing I'd ever heard. Yeah, I wasn't into dubstep at all as a kid. Everyone was talking about how great it is, and I thought 
it was just a whole bunch of ugly noise, and yeah, I'd be lying if I said I don't bear some of those same feelings today. Uh, granted, my feelings are a bit more nuanced these days. I now think that dubstep has its place in the larger world of music. I just think its place within the context of pop music specifically is a bit limited. I guess that's a pretty good thing then, because despite being one of Skrillex's signature songs, Bangarang really isn't dubstep. It certainly got some classic wubs and dubs thrown in there, but yeah, Wikipedia actually doesn't list this as dubstep. They call it electronic rock. It also falls under the niche micro-genre categories of Complextro and Moombacore, which... Sure, why not? Honestly, as fun as it is to mock the Spotify wrapped era of genre classification, I do think that this deserves to be classified as more than just pure dubstep. Because while a lot of dubstep principles are at play here, the genre of complextro, which was a term invented by Porter Robinson in 2010 that describes highly textured bass and instrumental textures that cut harshly between each other in a glitchy yet patterned way, is kind of the perfect way to describe this. Though Bangarang only peaked at number 72 on the Hot 100, it went multi-platinum in the US, and that makes perfect sense. Like I said, this song is literally the exact definition of what I think of when the term banger is brought up. Not just because of the title, but also because it's literally impossible to hear that drop without banging your head as hard as you possibly can. It's essentially taking the same energy that punk music had back in the 70s and updating it for the modern day. Smashing hard against the conventions of popular music and tiptoeing right up to the line of what's considered pleasant to listen to. And within that liminal space, finding something truly raw and primal that hits a perfect sweet spot between appeal and raw, feral energy. I still don't feel a lot of what Skrillex has done, but this one is an exception. I'll vouch for Bangarang until the end of time. And now, let's finally wrap up the last round of patron requests. She sends me pictures of her beautiful eyes And I never get the sense to tell my girl the truth I got the sense to tell some beautiful lies Well, this is definitely one of the most fascinating people I've come across doing this show. Alex Cameron is an Australian soft rocker who has a lot of random ties to an odds and ends mix of industry insiders, but is best known for his solo career where he essentially plays the character of the most miserable, pathetic failure of a guy in pretty much every aspect you can imagine. I found a line from him saying, quote, I write about the outlier, the table for one guy, the guy whose life is a constellation of microscopic tragedies. My characters come from a place where ambition, crippling self-doubt, and tragedy intersect, unquote. And that's incredible apparent in this song, True Lies, where he basically talks about falling down the rabbit hole of ads on porn sites and getting addicted to the fake intimacy that people in sex chat rooms give to him. It's honestly both really funny and genuinely captivating at the same time, because he talks in such a flippant and unbothered way about he's ignoring the girl he has in real life to focus on the girls he sees and talks to online. And he even says that for all he knows, the person on the other end of the chat room could just be some Nigerian guy, but damn it, whoever it is is getting him off and good, so who cares? It's just so viscerally pathetic, but he's just so so into it, and he's got such a great score and beautiful sax line to back him up that he makes you feel his love, regardless of the ridiculous place that love is being directed. I honestly have no idea what to do with this song, but I am definitely glad that I know it exists. <laughs> Seems like most of the dance music that gets recommended on this show is all very huge, loud, and bombastic, and if not that, then it's a pop crossover or some sort of deep-meaning artistic piece, but I feel like it's worth remembering that a huge percentage of dance music is just cool, groovy, instrumental riffs that jam on for minutes at a time. And this piece by Joel Klossel, founder of noted New York dance music label Spiritual Life Music, is an example of this. This song doesn't really have anything to say, nor does it have aspirations to overwhelm your senses or rattle your bones, it's just a really sweet, textured drum pattern over a funky bass line that jams on for seven minutes as beautifully arranged string sections and spunky popping flute rhythms wash over you. This is taking house music back to the basics, and it's a really sweet jam that I highly recommend as a sort of palate cleanser for your dance music tastes. We are never, ever, ever getting back together. No idea where y'all are finding this shit. This is Mako, Japanese singer-songwriter who I was able to find very little information about. Not even the J-pop wiki has any info on her, but whoever she is, she apparently did a cover of We Are Never Ever Getting Back Together by Taylor Swift, and yeah, it's a good cover. Not really sure what to say about it. It's clearly a much more sweeping, orchestrated version of the song with some really beautiful piano and string runs in there. There's probably a specific Japanese subgenre this falls into, but for my money, I'm reminded of those early to mid-2000s mainstream pop songwriter chicks like Vanessa Carlton and Sarah Bareilles. Like if A Thousand Miles were performed with a backing band on SNL, I imagine it'd sound pretty similar to this. The switch between Japanese and the verse and English on the chorus is a nice touch too. It's a new interpretation of something we all know very well, and it sticks the landing. Good work, Mako. 
And I said, hey, 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 it's just an ordinary day. And it's all your state of mind. At the end of the day, you just got to say it's all right. So apparently this feel-good folk rock song about just putting one foot in front of the other, making the most of life, and enjoying each passing day has recently gotten some viral attention as the background song to montages of deaths in Dark Souls, and... Yep, that makes complete sense, because this song is so completely lacking in irony and so breathlessly happy that it honestly makes way too much sense that people can't help but jam irony into it somewhere. Not gonna lie, as soon as I read the comments, I immediately imagined knights being cleaved in half and thrown off walls, and it fit in distressingly well. That said, just because I'm a jaded asshole who's incapable of just letting happiness be as it is doesn't mean you guys have to be too. I do genuinely love this guy's husky voice, and the production that somehow doesn't have an accordion in it despite the fact that one would definitely fit in there incredibly well. Whether ironic or not, there's definitely a lot to like here. According to this requester, this song by Japanese dance rock band Seiken in Action is one of the most finely crafted dance pop songs of all time, and you know what? I can definitely see an argument being made for that. This is exceptionally well put together. Even before I looked up the translation of the lyrics, I already had a good idea of what they were purely based on the sound, and hearing that the translation is about a girl so breathtaking that she sweeps him up like the wind, both disorienting him and thrilling him at the same time, it makes total sense with the way this sounds. One common pitfall a ton of dance pop songs fall into is having no real sense of build-up or anticipation, instead having a cheap version of that by having the final chorus just sound like the full and completed one and then introducing stripped down versions of that last chorus for the prior repetitions, and while that strategy can work, I really appreciate songs like this that have a true evolution in theme and tone over time, as it starts out dancing like the wind at the pace of a racing heartbeat and then swells into a grand epic scope and lets the moment hang for a while before kicking back in. I don't know if that really makes sense, but it's the best way to describe this, because on the face of it, this really is just another J-pop synth track, and yet I thought it was able to convey its emotion so thoroughly that I got the very specific vibe it was going for, even without knowing the language, and that's pretty damn special. When I'm back on a track. at this point, I think gaming YouTuber who drops an emotional powerbomb of a single that blows everyone away by being way better than it has any right to has been a frequent enough phenomenon that it merits its own genre. But I have to say, even among that crowd, Sisyphus by Quadeca is pretty damn incredible. If most of you have heard of this guy before, it's probably through the diss tracks he exchanged with KSI, but as it turns out, that was mostly just a publicity stunt, and this guy is, like, a legit rapper and producer. And this song is an absolutely show-stopping blend between orchestral chamber pop, some heavy electronic elements, a bit of folky indie and R&B influence thrown in there. This is basically just every genre you'd expect from a YouTuber turned songwriter thrown into a blender, and it comes out fucking amazing. Using the metaphor of Sisyphus, the man damned to push a boulder up a hill forever, might be an obvious choice to represent the stresses of trying to make your way as an independent creator in the modern hellscape, and how he just wants all the pain to blister over so he can finally stop dealing with it and just bitch about it to his friends, and that's only one tiny part of the odyssey this song takes you on. I'm honestly kind of at a loss for words trying to convey everything this song does, but all those those things are virtually perfect. This is a magnum opus that I highly suggest checking out for yourself. Beautiful is the word I would use to describe it. When people suggest tracks for this series, I give them an opportunity to share their background with the song and why they chose it. This particular requester did not choose to share any reason why they picked this one up, which is kind of leading me down the path of, damn son, where'd you find this? Because I could find practically no information about this song or this group online. I mean, I assume they're from Atlanta based on the way this sounds, and I did find that this is from 06, which definitely tracked with the big ringtone rap boom of the time, but beyond that, nada. I got no clue what this is, so we just kind of have to take this at face value, and, I mean, I kind of dig it. You know, for what it is. It's obviously not aspiring to be high art here. It's about taking dirty pictures with your newfangled 2006 flip phone. Not too much there. But I'll be damned if they didn't find a hot ass beat to put this over, and unlike most ringtone rap, they actually bothered to put a few good switch ups in there, which makes this almost feel like a real song. No comments and all on the guys on it. They're not bad, but generic is all hell. But whoever produced this, and you didn't have to go this hard. Someone needs to rediscover and sample this, because this kind of kicks. No one cares, cause life's not fair. Keep smiling. And 
here we have another song that I have virtually no background info on, with this apparently being a song this requester's co-worker shared immediately before quitting, which, yeah, this does sound like the theme song for someone about to quit a job, I'll say that much. I'll also say that Swimming With Bears is a fucking awesome band name, and according to their Twitter, they're performing on a cruise ship with Bowling For Soup and the American Authors, so I guess they're doing pretty okay. And if all their stuff sounds like this, then I'd say they deserve to, because it's pretty sweet. It's basic for the genre, a typical post-ironic statement to just ignore the shit of the world, keep moving, and keep smiling through it, a basic concept, but, you know, that's fine by me. And the lead singer similarly got a pretty standard voice for this kind of indie rock, but damn it, they sell it. I also like the nice little growling, grungy undertones they add to the otherwise pretty standard pop rock song, and it gives a nice little edge to help it stand out a bit. Nothing crazy, but nice and solid. Thumbs up. I need a For our last request of the evening before our number one pick, we have what is in all likelihood the single wonkiest thing the great Sir Paul McCartney has ever done in his entire esteemed music career. The fact that this was the third single off of an album that had a number one hit on it is absolutely baffling to me, especially for 1980, which was when Paul decided to start experimenting with synths, came up with an absolutely psychotic typewriter war of a melody, and sang out a nonsense song about leering at his secretary or whatever the fuck he's on about. Honestly, as bizarre as this might seem at first, it's kind of a hundred geck situation going on here where it does actually get stuck in your head distressingly easily. I can definitely see why this song has such a cult following. As bizarre as the base of it is, Paul still knows how to write a good hook, and this is definitely a song that you're not gonna forget after hearing it, and I honestly think you'd have to have a pretty big stick up your ass to say that you hate this. If you are in that camp, though, don't worry. Paul's next single after this was Ebony and Ivory, so hopefully you'll find that one a little bit more pleasant. And now, let's finally wrap this up once and for all with the winner of the main vote. Let's do it. Yeah, sorry, but I got no clever intro for this one. This is just a bop. <laughs> This song won the vote, so I really, really wish I had some sort of profound ending statement here, but frankly, I don't think this song really needs it. In the grand tradition of electronic music, one thing has become abundantly clear. You really don't need much to become an all-time classic of your genre. If you can find an awesome slamming synth riff, pair them with some potent yet simple lyrics that match the vibe of that riff, and create an underlying instrumental that joins the two in beautiful parody, then you've got it. You only need those few elements, but of course those elements have to be truly exceptional, and I do think that Midnight City by M83 does do those elements exceptionally well. It is impossible to think of the excitement of city nightlife without that riff blaring through your head. It's impossible for me to believe that this song is barely more than a decade old because it feels like a universal force that's been there since the start. This song got more votes than any other in this countdown, and typically the songs that win in this vote are either really topical by an artist who's relevant at the moment, or are just a grand sweeping epic classic, and this song really is the purest example of the latter. I don't know what you guys want me to say about it other than that it's one of the purest examples of how a song doesn't need to be complex or particularly interesting to become a generation-defining classic. The early 2010s were the last time I can remember that society on whole really felt hopeful. Obama had just been elected, we all had iPhones for the first time, it truly felt like the world was opening up into a new era. And while it wouldn't take long for everyone to realize just how foolish and misplaced that sense of optimism was, this is a song that captures that lightning in a bottle excitement of glaring over a midnight city, being young and full of life, and knowing that the big wide world is out there waiting for for you. And for that, this is a song that I will always treasure. Thank you all for watching and participating in this video. Once again, every single song discussed in this video was selected by you, my patrons, and if you'd like to take part in the voting for the next episode, for a pledge of just $2 per main series video, you can select literally any piece of music in the world you want me to talk about and take direct part in the voting to decide the song selection for yourself. Like I said before, the voting starts tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern time, so there's never been a better time to hop on if you're interested in taking part. Literally every single 
dollar helps as I try and make this channel my full-time job. So if you could donate two dollars per video, that's less than a five dollar bill per month. That would be immeasurably helpful. Of course, another option would be to join the one dollar tier, which won't get you voting privileges, but it will get you your name in the end credits and give you a chance to be randomly selected to give a patron review in every ranking I make. Once again, literally every little bit helps, and I can't thank you enough for your support. For a pledge of five dollars per video, you get to join my Discord server and hang out, talk, and play games with me, a bunch of my fellow content creators, and a ton of other cool people. A pledge of $10 per video will get you early access to every video I make, plus a personalized icon in the credits, as you can see on the top of the screen. While a pledge of $20 per video will give you a chance to personally select any song for me to give a review on in each new episode of Grab Bag Reviews. And as you can see in this video, you can select literally anything and have a 100% chance of me talking about it. Thank you so much for your support, and thank all of you so much for watching through the end of the video. I'm Sean Faye Wolf of Diamond Deck Studios, and until next time, take care of yourself. First in my class, they're at MIT. Got skills, I'm a champion at D&D. MC Escher, that's my favorite MC. Keep your 40 out, just have an Earl Grey tea. My rims never spin. To the contrary, you'll find that they're quite stationary. All of my action figures are cherry. Stephen Hawking's in my library. My MySpace page is all totally pimped out. Got people begging for my top eight spaces. Yo, I know pie to a thousand places. Ain't got no grills, but I still wear braces. I order all of my sandwiches with mayonnaise. I'm a whiz, a minesweeper, I can play for days. Once you see my sweet moves, you're gonna stay amazed. My fingers moving so fast, I'll set the place ablaze.